Great, hi. Um, my name is Ann Deitch. I'll be doing the presentation on Section GG. And I want to thank uh, CMS and Econometrica for the opportunity to present this work um, in this section. I have been involved in this work for about 10 years at this point. I was part of the uh, team that reviewed all of the assessment tools that were being used in post-acute care and uh, helped develop the um, item set that was uh, the care item set. And these items are derived from that item set. Um, so the slides are up for GG at this point. So um, again, uh, this is a section about functional abilities and functional goals. Next slide. Um, so the objectives for this section are to illustrate a working knowledge of Section GG functional abilities and goals. Uh, we want you to be able to articulate the intent of the items. And I know we've already gotten some questions um, as part of the uh, preparation for this uh, program. Um, we want you to be able to interpret the coding options for each new item and when they would be applied. And we also want you to be able to accurately apply the coding instructions in order to uh, come up with uh, accurate scores. I did want to uh, mention a couple of uh, items that you have on your tables. First of all, uh, you have cards like this at each of your tables. So as I'm going through my presentation, if you have any questions that you'd like to um, ask about any of the items or maybe some of the examples trigger a question, um, please feel free to fill out these cards. Um, I believe uh, the Econometrica team will be picking those up at breaks. Uh, they'll be looking for those. And um, that will help us to be able to address your questions. Uh, we did this at the uh, training that we did for the long-term care hospitals back in um, the fall last year. And it was very helpful to get kind of, you know, this is a, you know, a major theme of questions. And so we're able to address that at the training. So there's no limit. You're welcome to submit as many cards as, as you want. I um, also want to mention that there is an ERF QRP, ERF Quality Reporting Program Help Desk, and I would encourage you to ask questions after this training if you have follow-up questions, and I think you'll hear more about that uh, later today and tomorrow. The other item that I'd like you to have handy that I think will be helpful is a copy of the ERF Pie. So everybody should have gotten a packet, and within that packet is a copy of the ERF Pie. So we are talking, obviously, about Section GG, which starts on page 6 of the ERF pie. The first page um, has the prayer functioning. Um, probably the most helpful time for you to look at it um, is when we get to the items on page 7 and page 8 and page 9. Okay, and with that, I will get started. So. As I said, um, the, new, um, the items in Section GG are new and, again, are effective with discharges October 1, 2016. And the, there's really um, a few types of questions in there. So within the first um, page, you have GG0100, which is prior functioning in everyday activities. You also have GG0110, which is prior device use. You also have GG0130 with self-care activities, which has both admission information, admission performance, discharge goals on the admission side, and then discharge. And then there's also mobility questions uh, collected both at admission and discharge. So the intent of this section is, again, to focus on prior functioning. The um, second intent is to have items that describe the functional status of patients, baseline functional status on admission. And that also is collected at discharge so that we can see improvement in function. The um, function also uh, has on the admission side goals that are the ex person's expected function by discharge. So there's really three types of questions overall. There's the prior functioning questions with a very basic rating scale because we know you can't get a lot of detailed information from patients about prior functioning. There are questions about performance on both admission and discharge. And then there's questions about expected and or anticipated functional status by discharge on the admission assessment. So we'll go through those. 
But the performance I will generally speak of, it could apply to admission or discharge. A lot of the examples that I have are either admission discharge, you can probably tell which they are, but it doesn't really matter. They, it's scoring the same. The um, admission and discharge and uh, uh, self-care mobility activities assess the patient's need for assistance with self-care and mobility activities. So I use the word activity a lot. I just want to be sure you have a definition for that. So we actually use the International Classification of Functioning definition of activity. And in that definition, an activity refers to the execution of a task or action by an individual. So activities are things like eating, um, oral hygiene, walking. So when I talk about an item or an activity, I'm talking about the items on that page seven and page eight and nine. So as you know, many patients who are admitted to an ERF have self-care and mobility limitations. And because of these limitations, there are risks for additional uh, mobility and uh, functional decline. So, um, and complications due to limited mobility, such as pressure ulcers. So that's uh, obviously an important uh, reason why this functional status data is important to collect in an ERF setting. So we're going to start off with uh, GG0110. So if you're looking at the ERFPI itself, this is on page six. So I'm not sure if your preference is to take notes right on the data set or if you're using the slides to take notes. But either way, um, it's on page six if you want to look at exactly how it looks like. So in the area of prior functioning, you'll see that we have a three-level rating scale, where three is independent, two is need some help, and one is dependent. We also have the option that it may be unknown or that the information is not applicable. So again, the rationale for prior functioning is that knowledge of the patient's prior functioning prior to the current illness, exacerbation, or in, uh, illness injury may inform treatment goals. And in fact, when we, um, as part of the functional status quality measure that Stacy mentioned earlier today, we actually analyzed data from the post-acute care payment reform demonstration where the, these data were collected. And we found that when you look at prior functioning, it really did affect how much functional gain or the patient's discharge status. When we were developing the care item set, we did go around to a lot of the post-acute care centers as well as acute care centers, and many centers were already asking about prior functioning. It was just asked about in many different ways. It wasn't standardized. And so what we're basically doing as part of this section GG is we're standardizing the way this is collected across inpatient rehabilitation facilities as well as in other settings. And one of the, we've only included in the data set the um, items that we are needing for risk adjustment on the admission assessment. So obviously prior functioning, you'd only need to collect once anyway. Um, and it could be if it was in the medical record from acute care, because maybe the, a therapist had seen the patient in acute care, that information um, you know, may be available to you. But what we found in the post-acute care settings, many therapists and nurses were asking about this specifically. So this information can be gathered a couple of ways. Um, first of all, it can be uh, obtained by interviewing the patient, or if the patient isn't able to provide this information, it could come from a family member or significant other. Um, also, it could be in the medical record. Maybe um, if you're an EarthPi coordinator or, or PPS coordinator, whatever your title is, um, you may actually be relying on looking at the medical record because maybe the therapists are asking this information, or maybe it's in the acute care medical record. So gathering this information from the medical record is also uh, an appropriate um, strategy to get the information. So just to go over in detail, and again, um, this is right on your EarthPi data set, so you don't have to write down these definitions, but this information uh, is collected only at admission to the Earth setting, and the codes are code three, independent, which means that the patient completed the activity by him or herself with or without an assistive device that does not affect their score on this particular item. 
and uh, basically with independent, the person did not get assistance from another helper. Code two means that the person needed some help, and in this case, that is defined as the patient needed partial assistance from another person to complete activities. And code one is dependent. The, the helper completed the activity for the patient. We also have the code eight, unknown. If the patient's usual ability prior to the current illness, exacerbation, or injury is unknown, so maybe the person is not able to respond, maybe the person has some kind of communication problem, and a family member hasn't been able to provide that information, you can use the code unknown. Code 9 is also available and means not applicable, and this would be coded if the patient um, did not perform that activity prior to the current illness, exacerbation, or injury. So again, uh, you'll be recording the person's usual ability to perform uh, mobility or ambulation prior to the current illness, exacerbation, or injury. If no information about the patient's ability is available after attempts to interview the patient or family and after reviewing the patient's medical record, code 8 unknown. We actually have had some questions that have come in through the help desk about this. Um, particular item, why is there a code 8 unknown? And for those of you who are familiar with um, reporting, for example, the pressure ulcer items on the current ERF pie, you may be aware that there are, um, there are data specifications that give you the list of what are the allowable um, codes that can be entered for each of the items. And in addition to what is provide in the manual, you can also enter a dash, which indicates that there's no information. So we've had several, and I will talk about dashes in a little bit, but I did want to mention that we have gotten quite a few questions. Why would you use a known as opposed to a dash? And actually, um, if you do try and attempt to get the information, uh, you should code eight unknown. You would only put a dash if there was no attempt to get any of the information. And I would really encourage you to put the eight unknown because under the quality reporting program for many of the items, if you enter a dash, that means that you're not providing the information that's being asked by CMS and you're at risk for a penalty potentially. So we'll come back to this. And if, okay, I see there may be some questions about this. Please write down your questions. I will repeat it just because um, I just want to be sure it's clear. So if you um, are trying to get prior functioning data and you've made an attempt to try and get it from the patient, the medical record, or family member, you can't get it, you should code an eight. So try and avoid dashes. I will talk about dashes in a little bit. Okay, so uh, we have some examples uh, to um, go over. That Some of these are in the manual, some of them are new. Um, but we, it'll give us an opportunity to kind of go through these together. And again, these may trigger questions, so I encourage you to write these down on your cards. So um, on slide 13, you'll see for self-care, uh, we have a coding scenario and example. Uh, Ms. R was admitted to an acute care facility after sustaining a right hip fracture and subsequently was admitted to your ERF for intensive rehabilitation. Prior to the hip fracture, Ms. R was independent with eating, bathing, dressing, and using a toilet. Ms. R used a raised toilet seat due to arthritis in both her right joints. The patient and family indicated that there was no safety concerns and that she performed these everyday activities in her home. How would you code GGO100 and what is your rationale? Oops, sorry. Don't look at the answers. <laughs> okay, so um, the answer to this particular one is that she would be coded independent, and we just wanted to reinforce that use of a device doesn't make a difference. She is independent, so it's really focused on whether there was assistance being given. And in this example, it said that the patient did this at home without assistance to a helper. The patient may use an assistive device, and it would still be coded as independent. Okay, another example, get a little bit harder here. Um, so in this 
example, it's related to stairs. Ms. P has continued to show signs and symptoms of possible delirium since admission to the IRF. The IRF staff have not received any response to their phone messages for Ms. P's family members requesting a return call. Ms. P has not received any visitors since admit his admission. The medical record in, from the prior facility does not indicate whether Mr. P, Mr. P's prior functioning. There is no information to code uh, GG0100C, but there have been attempts for locating this information. So this is the point that I was trying to make before. How would you code this? Okay. Awesome. So um, at this point, um, you have, I'm the first person to do the polling, so um, I'll need to spend a little bit of time. So on each table, there should be two gadgets, and um, Anila, maybe you could hold them up so that, so there should be two gadgets on each uh, table, so uh, whoever wants to fight for them, and whoever didn't get the penny, maybe, um, can have this, and, um, Take responsibility for maybe representing what the group might think about how to code. And um, so there'll be two responses that come in from each uh, table. And uh, so I'll just go through the answers. And then as we go along, there'll be um, other opportunities to do the polling. So you can uh, pass around the, uh, the gadget as, as you'd like. But um, in this example, so I'll go over it. Um, so in this case, there was an attempt to get information, but they weren't able to get the information, but there was an attempt. So uh, A would be pressed if you think the right answer is dash. B would be coded if you think the code two is correct. C would be coded if you think code one dependent is the correct answer. D would be used if you think eight unknown is the right code, and E nine not applicable is another option. So go ahead and press what you think is the right answer, and um, I think I will. Okay. All right. So you got it all right. Thank you for listening. <laughs> Terrific. Okay. So that was an easy one. These are going to get harder. So hang in there. All right. So the next practice coding um, is related to stairs. So. Um, uh, so as you can see, there's like four areas within the prior functioning. So self-care, indoor mobility, ambulation, we talked about that, stairs, and then also uh, functional cognition. So in this particular one, we're talking about stairs, and uh, the correct code is eight. And at the bottom of the, the slide in this rationale is exactly what I said before about the dash use. So I will read it just to be absolutely sure. Um, so a dash is not used as the information was sought, but not available. Had there been no documentation and no attempt to get the information, then a dash would have been used. Okay, the next section is GGO 110, prior device use. So again, when we collected data from the post-acute care payment reform demonstration, we found that in addition to prior functioning, individuals who had used devices prior to the current um, illness, injury, or exacerbation, their prior use did affect functional improvement. And so we have included some of those items on the IRF pie. So the items that you check off, all that apply, and the options are manual wheelchair, motorized wheelchair or scooter, mechanical lift, walker, orthotics, prosthetics, and if none of those apply, we need a response of none of the above so that we know that you've provided a response. So, you know, if you try and submit an earth pie and nothing is checked, the system will reject the record because we want to be sure that everything has a response. Um, there have been questions that we have had on the help desk about why Kane is not on the list. And I will tell you that as part of the PAC PRD, we were told Kane might be important. And so we did include it in our data collection originally. Um, and it was not a significant predictor. And so again, we didn't, it wasn't necessary in order to calculate the quality measure. And so we've not put it on the data set. We were very 
we're very aware that the collection of data takes time, and so we are putting on the data set the data elements that are necessary to calculate the quality measures. So there are absolutely other things that could be collected, other things that we looked at in terms of what could affect functional improvement, and cane actually did not end up being a significant predictor, and so it's not on the data set. So I hope that makes sense. So um, the rationale for this item, just to build on what I, I said about the risk adjustment, um, knowledge of the patient's uh, use of devices and aids immediately prior to the current illness, exacerbation, or injury may inform treatment goals. So similar to the prior functioning, there's really two main ways to gather this information. So one option is to ask the patient or family. Another option is if it's in the medical record, that information can be obtained from either your medical record, because one of your other team members collected the information, or it's possible that the information um, was available in the acute care medical record, and either source is acceptable. So this, again, is only collected on admission, and uh, we have gone over the devices. They are uh, manual wheelchair, motorized wheelchair, scooter, mechanical lift, walker, orthotics prosthetic, and if none of those apply, please check none of the above. Okay, at this point, we're going to turn to the self-care items. So if you are taking notes on the earth pie, we are moving to page seven. And if you are looking at the slides, we're on slide 23. So as Mark mentioned, there's um, quite a few items in this section between these pages. And so I will be definitely covering the self-care activities before a break. Uh, we are scheduled to stop, I think, about 10.15. And uh, we'll take a break, and then we'll just pick off where we left off. But I do think that we'll get through probably self-care. Um, if you, again, have questions, I would encourage you to uh, start writing those down because the Econometrica team will be collecting those during the break. So um, if there's things that um, are kind of uh, coming up quite often and I know about that, I can address that as soon as we come back from the break or immediately after lunch. So I do appreciate that input. Okay, so in the area of self-care, um, there are seven activities or seven items. Um, this section is referred to GGO 130. And within this section, you will see that the items include eating, oral hygiene, toileting hygiene, shower bathe self, upper body dressing, lower body dressing, and putting on and taking off footwear. In, if you're looking at the earth pie, you will see that there are two columns. So the first column is where you put in the person's admission performance. So that can be any of the codes that we'll be talking about. And then in the second column, so this is still the admission assessment, you're putting in the discharge goal. So this is an expectation of where the person may be at the time of discharge. So the rationale for these items is, as we've stated, several times, earth patients may have self-care limitations at the time of admission, and they are at risk for further decline. So in terms of the steps for assessment, I'll be spending quite a bit of time going through this because I think there's some important points and some uh, supplemental information that I can provide based on questions that have already come into the help desk about this assessment process. So. Um, First of all, assessment of the patient's self-care status should be based on direct observation. The patient's, it could be supplemented by the patient's self-report, family report. Direct care staff may be providing information docu in, that may be documented in the patient's medical record or it may be something that you're able to get through interview. There is a three-day assessment period but I'd like to emphasize that we're trying to get an idea of, about the person's baseline functional status. So when a patient's first admitted to an ERF or to any setting, um, they're kind of getting used to the environment, they're getting used to the staff, 
So um, somebody might not necessarily feel safe that I can transfer that person. And so it may be the first transfer is a bit awkward because they're kind of, you know, making sure that I'm not going to drop them. Um, also, you know, you're kind of getting to know them. Um, also, people um, may be, you know, just a little bit anxious about the new environment. And so we, we don't want you to necessarily say the first time that the person, let's say, gets into bed, maybe they've come over in a stretcher. So getting from the stretcher into the bed, that's not an assessment. So this truly is an assessment. Allow the person to be as independent as possible. So if you have maybe um, somebody who, who um, is new to rehab and they want to do everything to help the person, you know, make sure that they know to let the person be as independent as possible. I know when I first started working in rehab, I wanted to be Nancy Nurse and be very, very helpful. And I had great mentors who slapped my hands and said, you are not doing them a favor if you help them do everything. So, you know, that is core rehabilitation. That is absolutely what you should be taking into account when you're doing the, the scoring, it really needs to be an assessment where you allow the person to be as independently as, as, as independent as possible. So we'll, we'll come back to this and hopefully you'll have some questions about this too. Um, but I, I do want to emphasize this assessment piece. Um, we often also get questions about who um, may be allowed to do these assessments. So um, there are obviously uh, licensure issues, professional practice. So we, we basically don't um, provide information like a nurse should do this, an OT should do this, a PT should do this. It is uh, up to your facility to, to determine who might be able to gather this information. But obviously, in addition to following facility policy, you would also be uh, following state um, and federal policies. So um, if any of you have sent the question to the ERF QRP help desk about pressure ulcers, who can assess? Is it the doctors? Is it the nurse? Who overrides who? We have that standard answer that it's based on facility policy as well as state and uh, federal regulations and policies. So patients, again, should be allowed to be as independently, uh, it's be able to function as independently as possible as long as they're safe. Um, if helper assistance is required because the patient's performance is unsafe or of poor quality, score according to the amount of assistance. So I do actually have an example where um, that's coming up. It's, I think, from the manual where the person is, um, the patient says, I don't feel safe, you know, I want you to stay with me. So if the nurse or the therapist does stay with the patient, then there is helper supervision. If the therapist or nurse, for whatever reason, that decides, you know, for whatever reason that they're not needing to be there, then there's, you know, the patient's anxiety, um, you know, the score wouldn't be lowered because if the, the clinical judgment was that the person didn't need to be there, then um, the score would be that the person was independent. So it's Basically, you know, whatever is happening is, is what should be scored. So we'll come back to that example in a little bit. Um, activities may be completed with or without an assistive device. Use of an assistive device to complete an activity would not mean that the person has a higher or lower score. If the patient's self-care performance varies during the assessment period, report the person's usual status. And we, we have in the manual that it's probably not going to be the most independent episode that happened, or it's not going to be the most dependent episode that happens. And here is a bit more of an explanation of that. So I mentioned before that when a patient's admitted, they might not, they're just kind of getting their bearings, they're figuring out what rehab's all about, who the staff are. So that's probably not a time that the person is really able to function at their baseline assessment. In addition, you're anxious, the patient's anxious to get rehab started, and so it may be that on a, uh, let's say day three, the person's already showing some functional improvement in certain areas. Maybe the therapist has given a device that's new, they've taught them how to use it, the person's mastered it pretty quickly, and so now they're more independent. So we don't want to capture um, therapeutic intervention improvement within the baseline. 
So hopefully this makes sense. We're after a baseline assessment, so it's before interventions, it's what the person is presenting as they're being admitted. We absolutely know that it's really tough to get all of these assessment items done within the first day. Many people come at what, four o'clock, five o'clock in the afternoon for you on a Friday? I know that's the most popular day for um, patients being admitted to ERFs. Um, so you're probably not going to be able to assess them on many of the activities and get a good feel for them on Friday night or maybe even Saturday morning. So we allow three days for the assessment. I know we've had questions that have come in. So if we score eating every time somebody eats, is it the mean? Is it the mode? Is it the, you know, whatever? Um, so we really want your clinical judgment about the person's baseline assessment. So you don't need to score every time that the person performs an activity. If, um, let's say, a family member comes in and, or, yeah, maybe it's a family member who comes in who, you know, wants to really help this person, wants to be helpful, and they, like, feed the person, even though the person could actually do it by themselves, I wouldn't report that as anything you know, that could be scored because it's not an assessment. The person wasn't allowed to be as independently, uh, functioning as independently as possible. So we can come back to this, but hopefully that provides some clarification. Uh, the bottom line is we're, we're after a baseline assessment. And if that happens to be in therapy, uh, that, you know, it may be that the therapists are the one performing the assessment in your Setting. And maybe the nurses are more involved in the discharge assessment where hopefully things are a little bit more consistent. But certainly on admission, there might be a lot of variation. And the, just when you're doing education with staff, it's the baseline assessment that we're after. Okay, so moving on to um, number six, um, refer to facility, federal, and state policies and procedures to determine which ERF staff members may complete an assessment. Patient assessments are to be done in compliance with facility state and federal regulations and requirements. Okay, so I want to go through the rating scale. So if you're looking at the EarthPi itself on page 7, you have it at the top of your page. It's also the same rating scale that's used for mobility, so it's also at the top of page 8 and page uh, 9 of the EarthPi. So again, it's completed admission discharge in terms of performance. And it is a six-level rating scale, where six means that the person is independent. And the definition of independent is that the patient completes the activity by him or herself with no assistance from a helper. At level five, the person requires setup or cleanup assistance. And this means that the helper sets up or cleans up the patient and then the helper um, is only providing this assistance prior to or following an activity. So obviously set up before, clean up after the fact. Level four is the patient is requiring supervision or touching assistance. And in this case, the uh, definition is that the helper provides potentially verbal cueing or touching or steadying. Sometimes in the medical record, you'll see contact guard. Um, and that type of assistance uh, is needed for the patient to complete the activity safely. I do want to highlight that that level of assistance, the supervision or the touching, steadying assistance or contact guard assistance, could be happening throughout the activity. Or it could be that it's only intermittently uh, occurring during the activity. So it may be one person gets one cue and another person gets, I don't know, 50 cues to get dressed the upper body. They would still uh, both be scored at level four. At level three, the person requires partial or moderate assistance. Here, the patient does, the helper does less than half of the effort. The helper lifts holds or supports the trunks or limbs, but provides less than half of the effort to perform the activity. At level two, we call this substantial or maximal assistance. Here, the helper does more than half of the effort. The helper perhaps uh, lifts or holds the trunk or limbs and provides more than half of the effort to perform the activity. And then level one, the person is dependent. The definition of, in, of dependent for this 
rating scale is that the per helper performs all of the effort. So if the patient does a little bit of effort, they get bumped up to a level two. The patient does uh, none of the effort at level one. Uh, so I'm going back to the definition. Patient does none of the effort to complete the activity or the assistance of two or more helpers is required for the patient to complete the activity. In some instances, especially on admission, some of the uh, more challenging mobility items or maybe some of the self-care activities, the patient may not be able to perform. And so we're interested in why the patient was not able to perform the activity. And there's three different codes to indicate why the activity cannot, uh, the patient was not able to perform the activity. Code seven is used if the patient refuses to perform the activity. We did not see this used that often during the testing of these items. Code nine is not applicable. And code uh, 88, which is the most commonly used code, is used when the patient um, did not perform the activity uh, due to a medical condition or safety concern. So for example, when we get to the mobility activities, we have items related to stairs, getting in and out of car transfers. Karen mentioned that earlier. It may be that it just doesn't make sense to perform those clinical assessments at the time of admission, and it's certainly appropriate to just put a code of 88. That's just not where the patient is, and as Karen mentioned, maybe by discharge, it's an important activity for this patient. So next, I'd like to give you kind of the I guess, think through of how to score based on this rating scale. So uh, you can basically just think through these questions and it'll help you get to the right score. So I'll be going through this for self-care. We'll revisit it for mobility. Um, so starting off with self-care, the key coding questions are one, does the patient need assistance? And when I say assistance, I'm referring to physical, verbal, or nonverbal cueing, set up and clean up. All of those things are assistance. So does the patient need assistance, any of those types of uh, level of assistance, to complete the self-care activity that we're trying to score? So if it's eating, does the person need assistance to eat? If the answer is no, the code will be six independent. If the answer is yes, the person does need assistance, then you go to the next question. Does the patient need only set up or clean up assistance? If the answer is yes, then you would code five, set up or clean up assistance. If the answer is no, we have to flip over to slide 31, and you'll see the next question is, does the patient only need verbal or nonverbal cueing or steadying or touching assistance? If the answer is yes, the code is four, supervision or touching assistance. And as I said, it could be intermittent, it could be throughout, so there's you know, a range of function that could be picked up here. And it could be both supervision and contact guard, level four. If the answer is no, that the person needs more than that, then the next question is, does the patient need lifting assistance or trunk support with the helper providing less than half of the effort? If the answer is yes, then that's a code three partial moderate assistance. If the answer is no, we'll go over to slide 32. And the question here that's next is, does the patient need lifting assistance or trunk support with the helper providing more than half of the effort? If the answer is yes, the code is two, substantial maximal assistance. If the answer is no, then you go to the last question, which is, does the helper provide all of the effort to complete the activity, or is the assistance of two or more helpers required to complete the activity? If the answer is yes, then the code is one dependent. So as part of today's training, we'll be going through uh, examples. Um, 
I know there are many examples that have come in through our help desk already that are actually great examples, so thank you for those of you who have submitted those. Our plan to make sure that we're sharing as much as possible is that we will develop either frequently asked questions or we will update manual pieces in order to provide all of these great um, examples that have come in. So, you know, today's the start, but we really, really do encourage you to contact CMS through the Earth QRP help desk if you have questions, because if you have the question, probably somebody at another table or maybe at, even at your table might have a similar question. So thank you um, for submitting those. I do want to again go over the uh, definitions of these activity not attempted codes just to go in more detail here. So in the event that a patient does not perform an activity either because um, let's say um, the patient refused, uh, the code is seven and again this is refusal. Um, I did get one help desk question uh, that's probably relevant here. Um, the um, question that came in was, well, what if a patient um, maybe has very poor balance and they don't want to get up and walk, so they are refusing, uh, but, you know, there are safety concerns. And so in that instance, it would be clinical judgment about whether you think the person truly is refusing and you know they should be getting up or you may say well in this case you know their concern is legitimate and so then you would code it 88 not attempted due to medical condition or safety concern so it's really clinical judgment in that instance about refusal as opposed to your judgment that the person has legitimate concerns about safety Okay, so we talked about seven. So nine, not applicable, is if the patient did not perform this activity prior to the current illness, exacerbation, or injury. We don't expect this to be used that much, but it, uh, some people did use it when we did testing of these items. So we, we have lost this as a valid code. Again, 88 is the main reason that you'll be coding um, this particular um, area of not attempted and the uh, not attempted means that the activity was not attempted due to the person's medical condition or a safety concern. So for example, if somebody um, has um, experienced a spinal cord injury or a stroke where that individual is not able to walk at this point in time, uh, it may be that you are indicating a code of 88 to say this person is unable to walk. Okay, so we have some coding tips. Um, again, based on our experiences with the testing and some of the questions that have come in over time. So first one is when reviewing the medical record, interviewing staff and observing the patient, be familiar with the definition of each activity. So we'll be going over the definitions today. On the admission assessment, code the person's usual performance using the six point scale or one of the three activity was not attempted codes. So that's seven, uh, nine, and 88. So it, um, on the admission assessment, you'll also rep be reporting a goal. So we will either get to that right before the break or after the break. But um, basically when setting goals, it didn't really kind of make sense to say that the goal was that the patient would refuse to do an activity. So. Um, that's not a viable code for goals. Actually, you can only code one through six if the person, um, when, you're, when you're coding goals. So it may be that the um, goal is for the person to maybe uh, be independent with eating by the time the patient is discharged. So that would be a six uh, for eating. So none of the activity not attempted codes can be used as a goal. So you can't refuse as a goal, you can't say 88 is a goal and that the person's medically unable and um, if, the per if the person is not expected to be able to do an activity, you would code a one that they would be attempt uh, dependent for that um, particular area. So we'll, we'll talk about that um, probably after break. Okay, on discharge, uh, you use the same six point scale that you used on admission, and of course you can still use the um, uh, activity not attempted scores for discharge, because it may be in some instances somebody is, again, still very um, 
um, limited in their mobility activities, and so perhaps they cannot go um, into and out of a car at this point, and so a code of 88 might still be um, the appropriate code for that person at discharge. So the next um, coding tips, um, when reviewing the medical record, interviewing staff, or observing the patient, oops, sorry, I did that one already. So on the next slide, um, do not record the patient's uh, best performance and their worst performance, but rather record the person's usual performance during the assessment period. And we talked about that a little bit already. Do not record the patient's assessment of the patient's potential capability to perform the activity. So yeah, if we had a car in here, they actually would be able to probably get in or out. So I'll think I'll code them such and such. So the activity does need to be performed. I know um, I've had a question come in about um, if there's not you know, a practice car in the facility, can you use Easy Street? Yes. Uh, you can also take somebody out to the parking lot, transfer in and out of their car. That's certainly uh, very acceptable. So you don't need a car in your facility. But if the person didn't, uh, that was not assessed, then you would need to make a judgment about um, why it wasn't done. Did the patient refuse? Did the patient, um, is it too, too not safe at this point in time for the person to perform the activity? And that would be coded 88. If two or more helpers are required to assist the patient to complete the activity, code one dependent. One of the questions that has come in about this particular um, issue that I thought was a really good one to mention today is um, if the patient's able to do some of the effort, so you want to give them credit for that, but you still need two people, so maybe one person is providing um, some, you know, the person's got a gate belt, maybe somebody's, you know, providing some trunk support as part of that person walking, but you're very concerned about their safety and fall risk, and so maybe somebody else is following with a wheelchair just to be sure. So if there's two people uh, required, it's going to be a one. So when I said before, if the person does a little bit of effort, they're going to be bumped up to level two. The exception to that is if there's two or more helpers required, it will be a level one that kind of overrides. If the patient does not attempt the activity and the helper does not complete the activity for the patient, code the reason the activity was not attempted. So we have had several questions on the help desk too about the 88 versus code one. So if the activity is done and it's done by the helper, it's a level one. If the activity is not done, so stairs or car transfers, um, activity not attempted would be coded 88. Finally, on the coding tips, to clarify your understanding of the patient's performing as, of an activity, ask probing questions of staff about the patient, beginning with the general and proceeding with more specific. So we're certainly aware that you will be collecting information perhaps from other staff to get an idea of the person's baseline functional status on admission and also uh, their discharge um, assessment will probably require, you know, to what extent is this, indivi uh, this individual patient consistently performing, um, let's say, the activity of eating. And so when you're asking questions, uh, you would be able to um, ask questions of this, uh, perhaps uh, you have some nursing assistants who are actually helping somebody with bathing. And so you would be asking that individual, you know, what was the patient able to do? What did you help? But again, the underlying important question, first and foremost, is did the patient, was the patient allowed to be as independently as possible? So was it an assessment? If the um, person, you know, again, family member is, you know, just helping the person, that's doesn't count as an assessment. Okay, I said I talk about DASH, here we are. Um, so for those of you who ha are familiar with the IRFPI and the quality reporting program, you are probably aware that a DASH um, can be entered into most of the items. Um, if you try and submit an IRFPI record and you leave items blank in the quality indicator section, it'll get rejected because we want to be sure that we have information on each of the um, items. 
And so if you do not have information, you would be entering a dash. Um, so CMS in general expects dash use to be rare for the most part. I will talk about goals in just a minute because there, there are some special circumstances with entering goals that I want to be clear about. Um, so do not use a dash for the self-care or mobility items if the, I, if the activity was not assessed because the patient refused. If the patient refused, put in seven. If the patient um, was, or the item was not, or activity was not applicable, enter code nine. If the activity was not attempted due to medical uh, condition or safety concerns, code 88. Do not enter a dash to say you don't have the information. Code those activity not attempted. So um, as I said before, use of dashes for quality items may result in a payment reduction as part of the quality reporting program. So um, be cautious about using dashes in general. We've tried to give you codes so that you can code things other than dash, hence my emphasis on the prior functioning and the code uh, unknown. Because you did attempt to get the information, we want to give you credit that you tried to get the information. So I do want to speak a little bit about goals. Um, so uh, Stacy did put up the quality measures uh, before, and I wanted to highlight that there are actually five uh, functional assessment related quality measures in the earth that were adopted for the Earth Quality Reporting Program. So four of those quality measures are focused on uh, functional improvement in the area of self-care mobility. So there's one measure in QF 2633, which is focused on improvement in self-care, or we, it's actually called change in self-care. There is a second measure in QF 2634, which looks at change in mobility or improvement in mobility for your patients. The third measure focuses on self-care. In this instance, we're looking at the percent of patients who meet or exceed a national benchmark by discharge, and that's based on the discharge uh, self-care score. And then there's an analogous mobility uh, percent of patients who meet or exceed the mobility uh, discharge score. The fifth measure is a process measure. It is, an, it is an application of NQF 2631. And for this particular measure, it requires that a functional assessment, um, functional assessment data were collected for patients on admission and discharge, and that, there, that um, function was included in the patient's care plan. And the way that you're documenting that function is part of the patient's care plan is by documenting at least one self-care or mobility goal. You are more than welcome, and we would love for you to report goals in areas where there are um, care plans. So if somebody is expected um, to, uh, let's say, improve in eating and oral hygiene and dressing the upper and lower body and footwear, please do report goals. It can be very useful for internal quality improvement. In terms of the Earth Quality Reporting Program, the requirement is that you submit at least one goal covering self-care or mobility. So if you put one goal for self-care, you're covered. If you put one goal for mobility, you're covered. If you put one for self-care and mobility, you're more than covered. So I hope that makes sense. And if you have questions, please submit them. So um, because you cannot enter or you cannot submit an Earth Pie without uh, every item, every quality indicator item filled in, uh, if you decide not to report a goal, let's say for eating, so you're going to report, let's say, a dressing goal and you decide not to report an eating goal, you can enter a dash as a goal. And, and that you're still meeting the requirement of the Earth Quality Reporting Program if you have at least one goal entered. But dashes are allowed in this instance, but you're still meeting the requirement. 
Okay, so if you have questions, write them down so that I can address it. But I guess just to reinforce one more time, if the patient um, has goals related to multiple self-care or mobility items, we'd love for you to report goals. You can use it for your own quality improvement efforts. Um, I know that some people do that as part of, for example, CARF accreditation, but for the quality reporting program, the um, monitoring will be to make sure you're providing at least one goal. Okay, so now we'll move into detail on the self-care activities, and we'll start off, of course, with eating, which is GG-O130A. So eating, um, and if you're looking at your earth pie taking notes, this is on page seven, right in the middle of your page, and we will talk first of all about the first column, which is the admission performance, will cover the setting goals um, at either right before the break or right after the break. So eating is defined as the ability to use suitable utensils to bring food to the mouth and swallow food once the meal is presented on the table or tray. It does include uh, modified food consistency. So we have uh, some coding scenarios, and uh, this will reinforce some of the definition issues and some of um, perhaps the documentation that you'd be looking for in order to accurately score this item. So um, in this particular example, Ms. S has multiple sclerosis affecting her endurance and strength. Ms. S prefers to feed herself as much as she is capable. After eating three-fourths of her meal by herself, Ms. S usually becomes extremely fatigued and requests assistance from the certified nursing assistants to feed her the remainder of the meal. So, you know, in this instance, you're perhaps getting information from a certified nursing assistant, but obviously in this instance, it looks like the certified nursing assistants did allow the person to be as independently as possible, and uh, it looks like this might be an admission assessment possibly. So how would you code GGO130A and what is your rationale? Okay, that's correct. So um, in this particular uh, example, eating would be coded as three partial moderate assistance and the rationale is that the certified nursing assistants provide less than half of the effort for the patient to complete the activity of eating. I do want to highlight that if somebody does not eat by mouth, they will not be coded on the eating item. You have to eat by mouth in order to be coded. If the person is only on G-tube feedings, you would code that eating activity does not occur because of safety concerns. So it's, if it's a swallowing problem or um, something, something else, uh, they're not eating by mouth, uh, they're getting food alternatively, perhaps through a G-tube, you would say activity, the activity of eating doesn't, did not occur. One um, point of clarification, this has come up through the help desk, if somebody is on G-tube feedings plus they're eating by mouth, uh, would you code eating? And the answer is yes. So basically you'd only say that the activity of eating didn't happen if they are solely getting um, nutrition and fluid through an alternative means. Another question that's come up is, uh, does this include uh, drinking liquids? And the answer is yes. So if somebody requires supervision or um, you know maybe some cueing because they have a swelling problem, whether it's related to actually food or liquids, uh, it, that would be supervision and that would be coded uh, the four for supervision. So it is food and liquid. So um, we have a, another example here, and I kind of gave you the answer, but anyway, um, Mr. R is unable to eat by mouth due to his medical condition. So maybe he's got a swallowing problem, he's experienced a stroke. He receives nutrition through gastrostomy tube, which is administered by the nurses. So you get to tell me the answer. Um, and so again, if you can pull out your polling uh, um, devices, so again, two people from each table will be able to score this, and the uh, options that you have for uh, this gentleman who is on G-tube feedings is you could code one, dependent, you'd press A for that. You could code two, substantial maximal assistance, 
that would be a B. If you think nine not applicable, that would be a C. And if you code eight not attempted due to medical condition or safety concern, that would be a D. Okay. All right, 98% of you got that correct. So the correct response is eight, not attempted due to medical condition or safety concern. So again, he was not eating anything by mouth, so it wasn't safe for him to eat. I do want to um, mention, um, I don't think I mentioned this earlier, if you press the wrong button, you can actually press again and your first answer will be ca canceled and your new answer uh, which of course will be the right one, will be accepted. Um, so if you press the wrong one by mistake, just press it again. That's the kind of thing I would do. Okay, so um, we'll move on to the next example. So we've put some of these um, as polling and some of them, you know, we're just going through the answers together. So we're just trying to give you a little bit of variety. So um, the next practice coding scenario, um, Oh, sorry, that was actually the rationale, I, I apologize. So we talked about the rationale already. So coding tips, again, just to reinforce, um, eating is eating and drinking by mouth. Uh, do not code uh, tube feeding administration if that's the only thing the person has. Okay, next um, is um, oral hygiene, GGO-130B. So in this instance, um, oral hygiene, I will read the definition. If you're looking at your IRFPI, this is on page seven. Uh, it includes the ability to use, to use suitable items to clean teeth, dentures if applicable, the ability to remove and replace dentures from and to the mouth, and manage equipment for soaking and rinsing them. So again, you're familiar with the rating scale. If you uh, want to reference back as we're going through coding scenarios, just look at the top of page seven of the IRFPI. So in this coding scenario, Ms. T is recovering from a severe traumatic brain injury and multiple bone fractures. So she may have been in a motor vehicle accident. She does not understand how to use oral hygiene items, nor does she understand the process of completing oral hygiene. We have a wonderful certified nursing assistant who understands the rehab process and allows the person to be as independently as possible. And she ends up, because the person is not able to do it, she brushes her teeth. And as part of it, she explains to the patient each step of the activity to engage cooperation from the patient, Ms. T. However, Ms. T requires full assistance for the activity of oral hygiene. How would you code GGO-130B, which is oral hygiene, and what is your rationale? Okay, level one, how many of you got that right? Great, okay, so in this case, um, and this is slide 49, oral hygiene would be coded O1 dependent, and the rationale is that the helper provides all the effort. So we had a great uh, certified nursing assistant who was explaining stuff, but the, the certified nursing assistant did do all of the activity. So we have another example for oral hygiene. Um, so in this case, Mr. W does not have any teeth. Um, his dentures no longer fit his gums. So uh, oral hygiene obviously is still important, even uh, for somebody who does not have teeth. And so Mr. W begins to brush his upper gums after the helper applies toothpaste onto his toothbrush. He brushes his upper gums but cannot finish due to fatigue. The helper completes the activity of brushing his back upper gums and then does uh, the entire lower gums. So you, okay, I heard a lot of answers that sound good. Um, so I will give you the opportunity to score this. So if you think the answer is for supervision or touching assistance, uh, enter A. If you believe the answer is three, code B. If you believe the answer is two, code two, or sorry, C. And if you think the answer is one, code D. You ready? Okay. All right, 86% uh, coded two, that is correct. 
Um, so just to be clear on that particular um, answer, um, he gets coded too because the patient was able to do the front, or the, I guess, part of his upper gums, but the helper did the other side and then the entire lower gums. So maybe that wasn't clear in the example and that maybe threw people off a little bit. But I would say that's more than half of the effort and so that's why uh, the helper um, assistance would, was substantial maximal assistance in coded level two. Okay, next we'll move to toileting hygiene. So this is GG130C. So toileting hygiene, so if you're looking at ERFPI, that is defined as the ability to maintain perineal hygiene, adjust clothes before and after using the toilet, commode, bedpan, or urinal. If managing an ostomy, it includes wiping the opening but not managing equipment. So we have an example here. Um, so Mrs. J uses a bedside commode. The certified nursing assistants provide steadying, touching, maybe you call it contact guard assistance, as Ms. J pulls down her underwear before sitting down on the toilet. When Ms. J finishes voiding or having a bowel movement, the certified nursing assistants provide steadying assistance as Ms. J wipes her perineal area and pulls up her underwear without assistance. So just to recap, um, so Mrs. J um, pulls down her underwear and then she, um, the, the nurse, certified nursing assistance is providing steady assistance. Mrs. J wipes herself, her perineal area, and pulls up her underwear without assistance. So how would you code that particular item? Okay, that's correct. I heard a lot of fours. So in this instance, it was steadying assistance that was being provided. So toileting hygiene would be coded a four supervision or touching assistance. And the rationale is that the helper is providing studying assistance. Okay, we have another example. And uh, the, the good examples do tend to be a little bit longer because they're more complex. So I'll take this a little bit slow to be sure we have time to kind of digest the information. Um, Ms. Q has a progressive neurologic disease that affects her fine and gross motor coordination, balance, and activity. She wears a hospital gown and underwear during the day, so maybe she, this, she was Friday night admission and this is a Saturday morning and she hasn't gotten into the therapy yet. Ms. Q uses a bedside commode. She steadies herself with one hand and tries pulling down her underwear with the other hand, but need assistance from the helper to complete this activity. So she got it started, so she's going to get credit for at least doing one um, little bit of the effort here. Uh, but the, the um, looks like it's a nursing assistant who's actually uh, helping to pull down um, her underwear. After voiding, Miss Q wipes her perineal area without assistance while sitting on the commode. When Miss Q has a, a bowel movement, the certified nursing assistant per, performs perineal anal hygiene, Ms. Q is too fatigued at this point and requests full assistance to pull up her um, underwear. So she did a little bit um, in terms of pulling down her, her underwear, uh, but the aid did help. And then she was able to do, um, um, when she voided, she was able to do that wiping on her own, but the, um, Nurses A does have to do perianal hygiene, and the other thing is that the uh, nurses aide had to do um, pulling up the underwear. So this one's a little bit tougher. Um, the options are A, that the um, score is four, supervision or touching assistance. B would be level three, partial or moderate assistance. C would be substantial maximal assistance, and D would be dependent, code one. Do you need a minute? Okay. All right, so 88% put a code of two, I agree. 
So, excellent. So the rationale is that the helper provided more than half of the effort in this case because the patient just pulled a little bit of her underwear down, but the helper did that. The helper completely pulled up her um, underwear after uh, the hygiene, and then some of the hygiene was done by the patient and some of it was done by the helper. So overall, we felt that that was more than half of the effort. Okay, so next we're going to move to um, shower and bathing self. So just to read the definition, um, the ability to bathe self in shower or tub, including washing, rinsing, or drying the self, does not include transfer into and out of the tub or shower. I will give you a warning. We have some of our examples. Getting in and out of the tub is included. We're trying to trick you, so don't get tricked. <laughs> giving you a warning. So... Um, so it is just washing the body. Um, it, um, in the definition, we do talk about getting into the tub or shower because that often is what the goal is, that the person would be able to do that at home. But you can uh, assess washing, rinsing, and drying if somebody's doing a bed bath or if they're doing it at the sink. So um, I know that's a question that's come in. So it is washing the entire body. So we have a coding scenario here. Um, Mr. J sits on a tub bench after he washes, rinses, and dries himself. The certified nursing assistant stays with him to ensure his safety, as Mr. J has had instances of losing his sitting balance. So maybe when he's trying to wash his feet, he leans a little bit too much forward, and so there's somebody there uh, to keep an eye on him for safety. The certified nursing assistants provide lifting assistance as Mr. J gets into and out of the tub bench. How would you code this? Okay, a four, that's correct. So remember I told you I was gonna trick you. So that last bullet is actually not relevant. We actually don't code uh, getting in and out of the tub. So it's just washing, rinsing, and drying the body. So I did hear a lot of fours, so that's great. You did not get tricked by me. Um, so in this particular instance, the um, helper is providing just supervision assistance, and the trans again, the transfer into and out of the tub or shower is not considered when uh, coding this particular item. Okay, another kind of long uh, scenario, so we'll talk through this. Um, a little bit slowly and in chunks. So, um, Missy e has had several progressive neurologic conditions, uh, has a progressive neurologic condition that has affected her endurance as well as her fine and gross motor skills. She is transferred to the tub or shower with partial moderate assistance, but of course you'll ignore that, right, when you're thinking about how to score this. When showering, she uses a wash mitt that was provided by the acute care facility prior to her admission to the inpatient rehab facility, so she probably had OT services while in acute care. Miss E showers while sitting on the uh, tub bench and washes her arms and chest. The certified nursing assistant then must help her wash with her remaining body uh, parts of her body due to fatigue. Miss E uses a long-handed handed shower to rinse herself, but tires halfway through the task, so the nursing, uh, certified nursing assistant dry, dries Miss uh, E's entire body. So just to recap in this instance, um, the Miss E uh, washes her arms and her chest. She does some of the rinsing and uh, the helper is washing quite a few of her body parts and helping with the entire drying and helping with some of the rinsing about halfway through. So here's an opportunity for you again to do some scoring. So if you, uh, so pass the, pass the gadget around. So if, um, Everybody needs to take a turn. So if you think the correct answer is four, code uh, press A. If you think the correct answer is three, code B. If you think the correct answer is two, code C. And if you think the correct answer is one, code D.
Okay, are you done? Excellent, okay. So, looks like 93% uh, coded C, which is two, and that is the correct response, excellent. So, the rationale is that the helper assists Miss E with more than half of the effort related to bathing, showering, um, and that includes, again, the bathing, rinsing, and drying, and hopefully you didn't get distracted by the tub shower uh, transfer. Um, next, I want to talk about upper body dressing, but I just want to check, Mark, or do I keep going? My timer is almost up. We'll go through quarter past. Okay, so we'll stay on schedule. I keep going. Okay. Great, sorry, I'm getting a signal that I've got less than a minute, so I just wanted to be sure I didn't cause problems. Okay, so um, with this particular, oh, thank you, whoever's updating that. Um, so we're gonna move to self-care upper body dressing now. So for upper body dressing, this is defined as the ability to put on and remove a shirt or pajama top. It includes buttoning if applicable for that patient. So we have some coding scenarios here. So um, Mr. K um, had a spinal cord injury that has affected both movement and strength in both upper extremities. He places his left hand in, into one third of his sleeve, so he does attempt to do some of the effort. Um, but that takes a lot of time and effort, and he's unable to continue with the activity because it's maybe frustrating for him, and he's, maybe this is just an admission assessment, and so this is kind of early on. The certified nursing assistant then completes the remaining upper body dressing for Mr. K. So if he's just wearing a shirt, and he's just starting to thread, how would you code the activity GGO130F, and what is your rationale? Okay, great, answer is two, that is correct. Um, so the rationale is that the patient can perform some of the effort, a small amount of the effort, and so he will get credit for that, and so he is not dependent. He is a code to substantial maximal assistance. So, um, you know, in the cases where you have a patient who maybe is admitted dependent on an activity and then makes some progress towards, let's say, something like bed mobility or upper body dressing, they will be able to get a higher score by discharge. Okay, so we have another example um, of upper body dressing. So in this case, um, Mrs. Y has right-sided upper body weakness as a result of a stroke that she experienced. She has worked in therapy to relearn how to dress her um, upper body, so this is probably a discharge assessment. During the day, she only requires a certified nursing assistant to place her clothing next to her bedside. Mrs. Y can now use compensatory strategies to put on her bra and top without any assistance. At night, she removes her top and bra independently and puts the clothes on the nightstand and the certified nursing assistant puts them away on the dresser. How would you code this? Okay, so the certified nursing assistant is putting clothing uh, within reach for her, so that would be setup assistance, and also the certified nursing assistant is putting them away, so that is on the cleanup side. So what do you think? Five, okay. And I do wanna highlight, because I, I do see this in medical records a lot, so in the last bullet you, you see that it says, at night she removes her top and bra independently. So if somebody needs setup, they're actually not independent, but I, I know I do see this a lot in medical records, Nobody fell for that one, so that's good. Um, but probably, you know, it should be clear in medical records in this case that it was set up assistant, the person was not independent because independent implies that the person can do the setup and the cleanup for themselves. Okay, so we, so you can go ahead and press your button. We, we did go through the answer, but just to kind of reinforce Give you a minute here. So we see we did put the independent answer, but hopefully nobody does that. Okay, great. So 98%, um, probably one person maybe pressed the wrong button. 
So it is set up or clean up assistance. Okay, we have another example here. Um, or, I'm sorry, this is the rationale. So set up, we already kind of talked through this. Okay, so now we're going to move to lower body dressing. So with lower body dressing, the um, definition of lower body dressing is the ability to dress and undress below the waist, including fasteners, but does not include footwear. So as you may remember when I went through the list of the self-care activities, there is actually a separate item for footwear. So the lower body dressing would include things like underwear, pants, belt if somebody wears a belt, um, or sweatpants if somebody uses sweatpants, um, skirt, things like that, but you do not include um, footwear. So no socks, no AFOs, no, um, no shoes. So we have a coding scenario here. Um, Ms. Z requires supervision while standing to pull up her underpants and pants due to balance problems. Ms. Z has a history of falls and has told her nurse she is worried about falling due to balance problems. How would you code GG0130G, which is lower body dressing, and what is your rationale? Okay, that's correct. I heard a lot of fours. So in this instance, the helper provides supervision due to safety concerns. So you're right, that is a level four. Okay, we have another coding scenario here, a little bit more complicated. Mr. B was admitted to rehabilitation following a total hip replacement. Let's say he's over 85 and he is obese. During the acute hospital stay, Mr. B was unable to use adaptive equipment for dressing due to severe arthritis in his hands. Mr. B cannot independently thread his pants nor underwear into his uh, feet due to hip precautions. Once the helper begins to thread his pants and underwear, Mr. B pulls them up to his knees, stands and pulls them up around his hip and adjusts the clothing. The helper zips up his pants. The helper puts on his socks and shoes. So do not be distracted by socks and shoes, right? Ignore that. So you have a minute to um, code that. The options are six, independent, five, set up or clean up assistance, four, supervision touching assistance, C, partial moderate assistance, three. Okay, so it looks like there, we may get some a distribution here of scores. So 92% of you coded three, uh, which is the correct response, partial moderate assistance. So very good. So um, in this instance, um, the rationale is that the provide, helper provides assistance with threading Mr. B's uh, feet into his underwear and pants and zipping his pants. Mr. B performs the remaining lower body uh, dressing tasks for this activity. Putting on and taking off socks and shoes is not included in this item. Again, we're going to be covering that item next. There's a whole separate item for that particular area. The helper performs less than half of the effort to complete the lower body dressing. So coding tips, again, um, Socks and shoes are going to be coded under footwear. So moving to footwear, uh, we have about five minutes left. So putting on, taking off footwear includes the ability to put on and take off socks and shoes or other footwear that is appropriate for safe mobility. So we have a coding scenario here. Mrs. F was admitted to rehabilitation for a neurologic condition and experiences visual impairments, fine motor coordination and endurance issues. She requires setup for retrieving her socks and shoes, which she prefers to keep in her closet. Mrs. F often drops her socks and shoes as she attempts to put them on her feet or as she takes them off. Often the certified nursing assistants must first thread her socks and shoes over her toes and then Miss F can complete the task. So she basically, you know, puts her, her, um, uh, her 
foot right into the sock, so she's doing uh, some of the effort, and then also she's actually putting on her shoes. Mrs. F needs the certified nursing assistant to initiate taking off socks and unstrapping the Velcro used on her shoes. How would you code this item? And what is your rationale? Okay, um, this particular item is coded three, partial moderate assistance for this example. The helper provides assistance with initiating, putting on, taking off Mrs. F's footwear due to her limitations, but Mrs. F is doing a fair bit of the effort. Um, so the helper, I hope that was clear in the example, the helper was just kind of getting things started, so that was the rationale. Okay, I, um, see, I think we will do this just so we can kind of wrap up this section, but I know we're going to take a break very shortly. So Mr. M is undergoing rehabilitation for right side, upper body, and lower body weakness. He experienced a stroke. Mr. M has made significant progress towards the independence and will be discharged home tomorrow. So this is a discharge assessment. Mr. M wears an ankle foot orthosis that he puts on his foot and ankle after he puts on his socks, but before he puts on his shoes. So I do want to mention that uh, if somebody uses uh, some kind of prosthetic or off orthosis that is considered like a piece of clothing so it's not set up it would actually be considered as part of the effort so um, in this case uh, he wears it and uh, he puts it on his foot or ankle by himself so you know he's already doing some effort there he always places his AFO socks and shoes within easy reach of his bed. While sitting on the bed, he needs to bend over to take on and off his AFO socks and shoes and occasionally loses his sitting balance, requiring touching or setting assistance for performing any of these um, tasks within the activity. So somebody is there, um, um, how would you code it? Okay, so the options are, Five, set up or clean up assistance, which would be A. Uh, four, supervision or touching assistance, which would be coded B. Partial moderate assistance, which would be coded a C, a C on your gadget. And uh, two would be uh, you'd press D. Okay, it looks like a fair number of people have put in. Okay, so it looks like 95% coded B, which is four, and that is the correct response, excellent. So the rationale is that um, basically Mr. M puts on and takes off his socks, AFO, and shoes by himself. However, uh, because of occasional loss of balance, which is very common uh, with uh, somebody with his uh, condition, uh, needs to help in terms of touching assistance for bending over. Okay, discharge goal. So if you are looking at the IRF pie, the uh, page that you should focus on at this point is page seven. And uh, as you know, the first column has the admission performance that we talked about. And then for each of the activities that are listed in the self-care area, there is a space in order uh, for you to be able to report a discharge goal. So we'll be talking about that next. So I'm going to spend quite a bit of time talking about goals now. What I'm uh, describing to you applies to both self-care and mobility, so I'll speak generally about it. Um, there are some examples to help you think through it. Um, when we get to mobility, I'll touch on it again, but this is really the main time that I will focus on goals. Okay, so um, this slide just shows you that we're focused on the second column. And just want to um, kind of reinforce that for goals, as I stated earlier, uh, you use the six points uh, rating scale to code the patient's discharge goals. Do not use code seven, nine, or 88 to code discharge goals. Um, as I uh, mentioned earlier, uh, if you choose not to report one or more goals, enter a dash because the um, IRFPI uh, submitted with blank spaces will get rejected. So with regard to goals, this is something that's very commonly done in rehabilitation, and uh, it needs to be a licensed clinician 
that establishes a patient's discharge goals based on the um, several factors, and this is uh, completed on the admission assessment only. So when setting goals, uh, certainly there are lots of uh, pieces of information that you might take into account, but uh, some of that may include the admission assessment. So when you're writing up the care plan, you would take into and thinking about interventions and thinking about what the patient's functional status might be in these self-care activities by discharge, you take into account, obviously, the admission assessment that's uh, been happening, discussions with the patient family, because obviously this is important that the patient and the family are on board with whatever the goals may be. And sometimes that's challenging. Certainly, you know, in some instances, the patient may want to walk, and maybe that's just not perhaps feasible um, by discharge. And so there will be potentially some uh, discussions with family and um, the patient and, you know, may take a fair bit of time. In other instances, it may be easier. Um, professional judgment and also professional standard of practice may be used when setting goals. I do uh, want to highlight that the uh, process measure, the quality measure, which is the application of 2631, uh, which is related to completing the functional assessment and reporting at least one goal. Um, CMS is, at this point, as part of the quality reporting program, looking to see if that information is reported. They are not calculating, the as part of that measure, they're not calculating the percent of patients who meet or exceed goals, but that's certainly something that you can do, and it's certainly something that's commonly done in inpatient rehab facilities. So um, again, just reinforcement, goals should be established as part of the patient's care plan. So um, in inpatient rehabilitation, in general, patients are expected to improve in function. Certainly um, there are instances where there are patients who may be admitted and let's say the self-care items may not be the area where functional improvement is expected. So perhaps somebody is admitted, they have locked-in syndrome, and perhaps uh, there's a lot of communication, therapy, um, speech language pathology, or helping the person to provide um, uh, intervention so the person can communicate with um, them and their family. And so perhaps the uh, items that we're talking about today, eating, may not be expected to improve. But there, in many cases, these are the items where patient improvement are expected in inpatient rehabilitation. So I will be going over examples and talking through functional improvement examples, but I just want to highlight that maintenance in some cases may be appropriate, what you might be reporting, so I just want to reassure you that that's acceptable. And in some cases, you may actually have a patient who has a lot of mobility issues, and let's say somebody doesn't have problems with eating, and so maybe because eating tends to be the easiest item for a lot of people, unless they have swallowing problems. So it may be that um, eating is independent on admission, and if you are writing a goal for eating, it may be the goal is to maintain sick you know, to be independent. And so that's certainly acceptable. So you may have some items where functional improvement is a goal, other items where maintenance is a goal. So um, again, lots of um, options that may be reported here. So uh, the first example I wanted to talk through, uh, which is relevant for ERFs, is that the goal is that the person will be improving on the activities that are being assessed in the self-care or mobility areas. So uh, the code reported on the patient's uh, discharge uh, goal in this case would be higher than the patient's admission because we have an independent scale where higher scores indicate more independence. So in this example, Mr. M has stated that he prefers to bathe himself rather than depending on helpers or his wife to perform this activity. So there's communication with the um, patient and in terms of their expectations and their wants. So on admission, the clinician assesses Mr. M's uh, performance to shower or bathe him and bathe himself. The clinician codes Mr. M's admission performance as two substantial maximal assistance because the helper performs more than half of the effort. The patient has expressed a wish to improve in function in this area, 
And so uh, the clinician reflects upon the patient's prior self-care functioning, current multiple diagnoses, the treatments that are expected to be provided during the Earth stay, the patient's motivation to improve, the patient's anticipated length of stay, and the patient's medical prognosis, and you know other things, but those are obviously some things that are relevant. The clinician discusses discharge goals with the patient and family, and they anticipate that by discharge, Mr. M will require a helper uh, to do less than half of the effort for assisting to complete this activity. So in this case, the patient started at a two, and the goal is that the patient improves to be a level three partial or moderate assistance. So that's one example. Another example, um, and this is one where, for whatever reason, the goal is to maintain function for this particular area. And so the discharge goal, in this case, um, the example refers to a medically complex patient who is not expected to progress to a higher level of functioning during the Earth stay for a particular activity. The clinician determines that the patient would be able to maintain his or her admission functional performance level. The clinician discusses functional goals with the patient and fa the family, and they agree that maintaining function for a specific activity is a reasonable goal. In this example, the discharge goal would be coded the same as the admission performance score. In other words, column one and column two would be the same. So on admission, uh, Mrs. E has stated her preference for participation twice daily in her oral hygiene activity, Mrs. E has severe arthritis, Parkinson's disease, and diabetic neuropathy and renal failure. These conditions result in multiple impairments, that is, limited endurance, weak grasp, uh, slow movement, and tremors. The clinician observes Mrs. E's admission performance and discusses her usual performance with clinicians, caregivers, and family to determine the necessary interventions for skilled therapy, that is, positioning of an adaptive toothbrush cuff, uh, verbal cues, lifting, and supporting Mrs. E's limb. The clinician codes Mrs. E's admission performance as level two substantial uh, slash maximal assistance. The helper does more than half of the effort in this instance, and that's the rationale for a code of two. So by discharge, uh, due to Mrs. E's progressive and degenerative condition, the clinician and patient feel that while Mrs. E is not expected to maintain improved uh, status in the area of oral hygiene performance, maintaining function in this instance is desirable and achievable as a discharge goal. The clinician would then report a two substantial maximal assistance as the goal. So again, the admission performance is a two and the um, goal for discharge is a two. Okay, so um, again, if you have questions, we would appreciate if you fill out the cards. Please make sure you put your name and email address so that if we don't get to it during the session today or tomorrow that we can contact you. So the next um, section that we're going to move to is uh, section GG170, mobility. And again, we have a three-day assessment period. And these items, if you're looking at the Earth Pie and if you're writing notes on the Earth Pie, it's going to be on page eight as well as page nine. I do wanna highlight that um, on pages eight and nine, we do have a third column and wanted to explain the rationale for that so that when we get to that section, uh, you'll be ready for uh, why it's uh, formatted the way it is. So the first column is similar to self-care in that we uh, would like you to report the patient's admission or, um, yeah, admission or discharge um, performance. The second column uh, is on the admission form and relates to the discharge goal for mobility. And then the third column in on the admission uh, asks specific questions that, that we consider basically gateway questions. So in order to minimize burden, we have basically screening questions asking if the patient is walking, and then also on the second page asking if the person is in a wheelchair. 
So if the person is not walking, then that allows you to skip all the walking and stairs items. If the person is not using a wheelchair, you can skip over the wheelchair items. So in this instance, uh, you're not leaving the items blank. You can still submit the earth pie. It's basically, if you code that the person is not using a wheelchair, the computer knows to insert a special code so that there is a code being submitted on your behalf there. So it's a skip. It's not, it, on paper it might be left blank, but in the IT system it'll be recoded to a special uh, code. Um, and so I just wanted to be sure I highlighted that now because on that third column on admission, there's a, you're not coding one through six like the rest of them. So um, just to kind of recap code, uh, in the first column you can code one through six plus the activity not um, attempted. In the second column you can code one through six as goals. And in the third column there's just special screening questions so they have specific codes. We'll get to that um, when we talk about walking and wheelchair. So um, I mentioned the screening questions. In the instance of wheelchair mobility, we also have follow-up questions. So in some instances, it may be that a person who is going to be going home uh, mobilizing using a wheelchair, they may use both a motorized wheelchair for longer distances and perhaps a manual chair for shorter distances. And so we ask you after the two wheelchair items, what type of wheelchair the person used or if they used a scooter. So we will cover that when we get to that section. So the rationale for the mobility items, obviously very similar to what you heard earlier today in terms of self-care and that many patients or essentially all patients admitted to an ERP would have mobility limitations. And a patient who has mobility limitations is at risk for further decline in function if they're not uh, physically active. So um, obviously patients are getting up very often and getting intensive rehabilitation in the rehabilitation inpatient rehab setting. Steps for assessment, similar to what we covered before. So the assessment can be based on direct observation. It can be based on patient self-report. It could be based on reports from other caregivers, including clinicians, care staff, family, or something that's documented in the medical record during the three-day assessment period. I know a couple of people came up during the break and were asking me about uh, the role of certified nursing assistants. So um, they're not permitted to do assessments, but you as the RN or PT or OT um, obviously can do assessments, but you can use information or facts that they provide to you. But as I stated earlier, it's really important that the, um, whether it's a family member or an aide or, or whoever who's, you know, reporting to you about how the person did with walking or how they did with um, bathing, it's important that you determine whether a true assessment was done. And this is um, particularly important in areas like wheelchair. Uh, so I'll bring that up just as a quick example because this really, um, um, it, I, I think is, is an, um, a good example. So if you gave me a wheelchair in a hospital that was not built for me and is just the hospital like can't maneuver, I would be dependent in a wheelchair. But that really doesn't reflect my functional status because, you know, that's not what I'm being, uh, not being worked on. And so just coding me and putting me in a wheelchair, pushing me down the hall and coding me at level one is not an assessment. And it's, it's not relevant for me um, at this point. So um, that wouldn't count. So if you're um, using wheelchairs to take patients to therapy, we're not interested in having that being reported. If the person um, has experienced a stroke or perhaps a spinal cord injury and is learning how to use the wheelchair and you know when they're uh, being discharged they're maneuvering and they have learned how to uh, whatever type of wheelchair it is they're maneuvering you know a joystick or whatever that is what should be considered an assessment for wheelchair. So I think sometimes there's been um, uh, 
a lot of effort to report every time something happens, and there, it's not all based on assessment. So again, assessment is critically important, and everybody, if the, I, I think I gave this example before, if, if a family member comes in and absolutely does everything for the patient, then, you know, that's not helpful information to know the person's functional status. You're just, you know, you've got a, a family member who wants to help a lot. Um, so you would use your professional judgment to say, okay, I'm going to base it on what the PT said the person was able to do, or the speech language pathologist, let's say, if it was eating, or a nurse. Um, so again, this reinforcement, allow the person to be as independent as possible, but keep it safe, obviously. Helper assistance uh, is required potentially because of poor or unsafe quality, so this particularly uh, is relevant with walking. So if somebody is very unsteady and, you know, maybe you think they should be supervision, but they kind of wobble a little bit, so there's uh, touching assistance that happens, the score would go down uh, based on that to a level uh, four for the touching assistance. Activities may be completed with or without a device, so we don't differentiate a different score because of a device use. You just code if the person needs help, um, and they may or may not use a device. Uh, use of devices uh, to complete an activity, again, will not affect the score. If the person's mobility performance varies during the assessment period, report the patient's usual status not the patient's most dependent performance, not the patient's uh, most independent or dependent episode. And again, refer to facility, federal, and state policies and procedures to determine which ERF staff members may complete an assessment. The rating scale uh, we described in detail before, so again, there'll be some reinforcement as we go through the items. Uh, you code, again, the usual performance, with six being an independent, five being set up or clean up assistance, four being supervision or touching assistance, three being partial moderate assistance, two being substantial maximal assistance, and one for dependent. Again, the codes that can be used for the assessment at admission discharge include these codes that the activity was not attempted, seven being used when the patient refuses to perform an activity, Nine, when the patient is doing an activity that's not applicable, or the patient's not doing an activity because it's not applicable, excuse me. And then code 88, if the patient uh, did not attempt an activity due to medical condition or safety concerns. Again, during our testing, we saw a lot of the harder mobility items, like walking on uneven surfaces, car transfers, picking up an object from a standing position, often not done on admission. Uh, those are mobility items and will be coded 88 on admission in many instances, and that's perfectly acceptable. So the coding questions, just to go through kind of the logic to help you think through this. Um, does the patient need assistance? And the assistance could be verbal, physical, nonverbal cueing, set up, clean, un clean up assistance to complete the mobility activity. So maybe it's... Um, getting from a sitting to a lying position. So does the person need any kind of help from a helper? If the answer is no, the code would be six independent. If the answer is yes, you would ask the next question, which is, does the patient need only setup or cleanup assistance? If the answer is yes, you code five, setup or cleanup assistance. If the answer is no, we will go to slide 107. Does the patient need only verbal, nonverbal cueing or steadying touching assistance? If the answer is yes, you code four, supervision or touching assistance. If the answer is no, you go down to the next question, which is does the patient need lifting assistance or trunk support with the helper providing less than half of the effort? If the answer is yes, you code three, partial moderate assistance. If the answer is no, you go on to the next question, which is does the patient need lifting assistance or trunk support with the helper providing more effort than the patient? If the answer is yes, you would code that a two, substantial maximal assistance. If the answer is no, you go to the last question, which asks does the helper provide all of the effort to complete the activity? 
or is the assistance of two or more helpers required to complete the activity? If the answer is yes, that would be then coded a one. If the activity was not attempted, again, the three codes are patient refused. If the patient refuses to complete the activity, nine for not applicable. If the patient did not perform this activity prior to the current illness, exacerbation, or injury, and 88 if it was not attempted due to medical condition or safety concern. When reviewing the medical records or you're interviewing staff or observing the patient, again, the definition of the activity is really important, so we'll spend time on each of the activity definitions as part of this training. On the admission assessment, you're coding usual performance using the six-point scale or the three activity not attempted codes. So it's exactly the same as what we talked about under self-care. For the discharge goal, you'll be reporting that on admission, and you can only use the one through six codes. At the time of discharge, you will be coding one through six, or the seven, 88, or nine. Do not record the patient's best performance or the patient's worst performance. Again, this is the intent on admission is to get a baseline assessment, and that may be happening in therapy. Um, at discharge, it may be that there's um, differences in the person's functional status, and maybe for the most part, they're walking quite well, but maybe getting up in the middle of the night, they are unsafe. And so, you know, they do maybe have a lower um, ability at night. So that information would certainly be shared with the family at discharge, but it may not be always what you're reporting on the um, earth pie. So it really depends. So we're, we're after usual. Um, I think I talked about baseline a lot uh, in terms of the admission assessment. At discharge, in general, one score isn't going to really tell you the whole story about the person's functional status. So when you're you know, talking to perhaps the next site of care or you're explaining to the family how much help the person needs, you're not going to say, well, there are, you know, a supervision set up for, you know, each of the self-care activities and, you know, there's more to the story than that. So certainly um, that information is very relevant, absolutely should be documented. On the IRF pie, what you'll be reporting is the usual status. So kind of generally where the person is on admission and discharge. Um, again, similar to uh, the self-care activities, uh, don't, you know, you wouldn't say, well, I think the person, based on their ability to get on and off the toilet, I think they could probably get in and out of a car. If an activity is not assessed, then you just put the code um, of 88 or, in some cases, a dash if the activity wasn't tested and uh, it wasn't related to a safety concern. If two or more helpers are assisting the patient, the code would be one. And if the patient does not complete the activity and the helper does not complete the activity, code the reason the activity was not attempted. To clarify your own understanding and observations about the person's performance of an activity, ask probing questions if you're relying on information from um, other uh, staff. Um, and examples of using probes when talking with staff are provided within the training manual. And I think we have a couple uh, in this slide set also that we'll be going over. We talked about the dash already. So uh, just to kind of reiterate, um, for the admission uh, performance, uh, it would be unusual to code a dash. Um, Basically, you should be coding the sevens, the nines, the 88s. If an activity was not attempted, try and avoid the dashes because, again, that is something that is part of the quality measure that we expect that you at least address the items in terms of the patient perform the activity or the reason that they were not able to perform the activity. As part, one of the things um, that I do want to uh, mention because this is uh, related to coding. So um, uh, in some instances, when a patient is admitted to an ERF, the plan obviously is to have a complete stay. But in some circumstances, and I think the national data is about 10% of the time, there is an unplanned or unexpected discharge or an incomplete stay. We recognize that that's 
challenging, that there's a medical emergency often in those instances, and that you need to get the patient um, to the next setting or to the emergency department. And so function at that point in time is um, not the priority. So um, as when we were actually uh, designing the original items many years ago, we did talk to a lot of uh, staff in IRFs and LTACs as well as um, in, in um, home health and basically said, you know, how do you code function when there's these kind of medical uh, or situations that occur? So some hospitals were basically, some IRFs um, in particular were saying, well, we just code what their last assessment was in therapy. And then other people said, oh, we just put low codes because that person's not functioning very well. They had, you know, a, a pulmonary embolism and we, you know, or suspected pulmonary embolism, we had to get them moved out. We looked at the data, the scores were kind of all over the place. And so we felt that when we were calculating the quality measures, that was an incomplete stay and that it wasn't a full course of rehabilitation. It would be hard to judge improvement based on an incomplete stay. So the bottom line is if somebody is discharged and they have an unplanned stay, you can code an 88 to indicate that the person was too ill. And when we calculate the quality measures, so I mentioned before, we're going to look at functional improvement for patients in your ERF as part of uh, quality measure 2633, which is the self-care, and we expect as part of the, the quality measure that w went through the National Quality Forum, um, we exclude people who have incomplete stays. And we just felt that there's other quality measures that deal with readmissions and all that kind of stuff, and that it's really hard to judge, especially when there's wide variations in re discharge to acute across the facilities. You know, in some facilities there would be a lot of you know, maybe lower scores or inconsistent scoring. So bottom line, uh, and we can talk about this if you have questions, put them on the cards, but um, bottom line, we didn't think it was fair to really look at functional improvement when somebody didn't have a full course or their entire stag um, had um, this unplanned situation. So um, on the IRF pie, you would code 88 a discharge uh, to indicate the person was too sick. For those of you who work in other settings, you may be aware that in the LTAC setting, there are um, the admission and discharge data are reported separately. And a discharge, there's actually a planned discharge form and an unplanned discharge form. So, and in the skilled nursing, nursing home setting, there's different data sets out there. So in the LTAC setting, if you watch that training or you know, you're familiar with that setting, you would maybe know that the unplanned discharge form does not have the function items on. On the IRF pie, you're reporting it on all patients, including patients who pass away. So if the patient passes away, you can code 88 um, for the discharge function items for GG, self-care mobility, and um, also, if there's an unexpected discharge. If you're particularly interested, and I'm sure we can put this in FAQ, we do have a definition, of course, of what an incomplete stay includes. Um, it includes people discharged to acute care, as well as people, um, um, we length of stay less than three days. We, we have a whole criteria. It's part of the uh, quality measure that got approved and something that uh, we got a lot of support from um, earth industry experts when we were putting the quality measure together. So um, I'll make sure that in our FAQ that we kind of put that together so that you're kind of aware. Um, because of discharge, um, if a patient doesn't perform an activity um, for the quality measure, we recode to assume that the person's dependent because we do have to calculate the quality measures. So it's important that you're kind of aware what happens with the data and how that affects from a quality measure perspective. Okay, so that's, um, I'm glad I remembered to cover that in this part. Okay, so now we'll get into the items. So the first activity uh, in the, um, the mobility section uh, relates to bed mobility. We have actually quite a few bed mobility activities. 
Again, during the uh, development of these items, we visited and talked to a lot of uh, post-acute care facilities, and bed mobility items were commonly done, but not reported in a standardized way. And so uh, this was our, um, the result of our attempt to standardize this area. So rolling left to right is uh, defined, and you can look at this on page eight of the Earth Pie. It's defined as the ability to roll from lying to back to left and right side and return to lying on the back. So we have a coding scenario just as an example. Um, the physical therapist helps Mr. R turn onto his right side by instructing him to bend his left leg and roll onto his right side. He then instructs him how to position his limbs to return to lying on his back and then repeat the similar process for rolling onto his left side and then return to lying on his back. Mr. R completes the activity without physical assistance from the helper. So again, we've got a physical therapist who is involved in providing some instruction. How would you code this particular item? Okay, and what's your rationale? Okay, sounds good. So I agree. I um, would also code this uh, person as a level four based on the uh, um, input from the therapist. So the physical therapist provides verbal cues. Uh, we call them instructions in this example. Uh, as he rolls uh, from his back to his right side and returns to lying on his back. The physical therapist does not provide any physical assistance, so that's why it's a four. So now we have a practice coding scenario, and it's a little bit longer, so bear with me here. Mr. R has a long history of skin breakdown. The nurse instructs him to turn onto his right side, providing step-by-step -step instructions to use the bed rail, bend his left leg, and then roll onto his right side. The patient attempts to roll with the use of the bed rail, but indicates he cannot do the task. The nurse then rolls him onto his right side. Next, the patient is instructed to return to lying on his back, which he successfully completes. Mr. R then requires physical assistance from the nurse to roll onto his left side and return to lying on his back to complete the activity. So, what, how would you code this uh, example? So, code Options are six, independent, would be coded in A. B would be uh, five, set up or clean up assistance. C would be four, supervision or touching assistance. Two would be substantial or maximal assistance. So I'll give you a minute here. All right, so it looks like 95% uh, coded D, and you are correct. I would have coded it a two also. Um, so in this case, the rationale um, is that the nurse provided more than half of the effort for the patient to complete the activity of rolling left and right. The next activity um, also related to bed mobility is sit to lying. So in this case, sit to lying is defined as the ability to move from sitting on the side of the bed to lying flat on the bed. So we have just an example um, that we'll be going over together. Um, Miss, Mrs. H requires assistance from a nurse to transfer from sitting at the edge of the bed to lying flat on the bed because of paralysis on her right side. So maybe she's had a stroke. The helper lifts in position Mrs. H's right leg. So there's some lifting happening. Mrs. H uses her arm to position her upper body. Overall, Mrs. H performs more than half of the effort. How would you code this item? And what is your rationale? Okay, heard a lot of threes out there. I do agree with that. That's how we coded her. A helper lifts Mrs. H's right leg and position helps position um, her to a from the seated to a lying position and it's specifically told you she did more than half of the effort. Next coding scenario um, and this is for polling. So um, 
In this case, Mrs. H requires assistance from two certified nursing assistants to transfer from sitting at the edge of the bed to lying flat in the bed due to paralysis of her right side, obesity, and cognitive limitations. One of the certified nursing assistants explains to Ms. H each steps of this sitting to lying activity. Mrs. H is then fully assisted to get from the sitting to lying position on the bed. Mrs. H makes no attempt to assist when asked to perform the incremental steps of the activity. So how would you code um, this patient? Press A if you uh, believe the code is for supervision or touching assistance, code three for partial moderate assistance, code two for substantial maximal assistance, and code one if you believe dependent is the right code. Okay, give you a minute. Okay, it's kind of quieted down. All right, can't get more than 100%. Awesome. So I agree, code one. Um, two people, level one. Oh, so there's a comment about it not being licensed clinicians. So um, basically the clinician might be asking what the patient act, um, ability was. And so if, if that's what's happened, and in this case it was explained that the patient was obese, had cognitive problems, and so if it's the clinician judgment that the patient, you know, was allowed to do as much as possible, that would be fair. But your point is right that, you know, just because, you know, somebody says, well, the person was dependent, it's, you know, your clinical judgment to make sure that the, an assessment truly has been done. Okay, so the next activity is lying to sitting on side of the bed. So we're just moving all over the bed here. Um, so the um, definition here is the ability to safely move from lying on the back to sitting on the side of the bed with the feet flat on the floor and with no back support. So in this case, um, we have a, one example that we'll go over together as a group and then we'll um, maybe get into pulling. Mr. B pushes up to the bed, um, up on the bed, to attempt to get himself from a lying to a seated position as the occupational therapist provides much of the lifting assistance necessary for him to sit upright. The occupational therapist provides assistance as Mr. B scoots himself to the edge of the bed and lowers his feet to the floor. Overall, the occupational therapist indicates that she performs more than half of the effort. How would you code? this item lying to sitting on side of bed. Okay, I agree. I also coded this a two. Uh, the helper provides lifting assistance more than half of the effort, and so um, she's going to be coded a two. So now we have a polling question. Um, Ms. P is being treated for sepsis and has multiple infected wounds on her lower extremities. Full assistant, assistance from the certified nursing assistants is needed to move Miss P from a lying position to sitting on the side of the bed because she usually has pain and lower extremity um, in her lower extremities upon movement. So the reason why somebody can or cannot do an activity is not um, what we need to worry about. We just code what assistance was provided during the assessment. So um, how would you code this example? So. Option A is code four, supervision or touching assistance. B is three, partial moderate assistance. Code two is substantial maximal assistance. And code one is dependent. Give you a minute. Okay, all right, 98% coded a D, and that is indeed the correct response, one dependent. Uh, in this case, uh, code one was accurate um, or correct because the helper fully completed the activity of lying to sitting on side of the bed for the patient. The next activity that we will be talking about is sit to stand. 
and sit to stand if you look at the earth pie. Oops. Sit to stand is uh, defined as the ability to safely come to a standing position from sitting in the chair or on the side of the bed. Uh, Mr. M has osteoarthritis and is recovering from sepsis. Mr. M transitions from a sitting to a standing position with the steadying, touching assistance on the, uh, of the nurse's hand on Mr. M's trunk. How would you code sit to stand and what is your rationale? Okay, I heard some fours. Okay, yeah, I agree. Um, in this case, it would be a four, and again, it's the touching assistance. So, you know, in clinical records, people write all kinds of things like um, contact guard, um, you know, I'm not sure what practices at your facility, but all of those would be considered um, touching assistance. And in terms of supervision, I know in some places, um, people differentiate between uh, close supervision and distance supervision, they're both supervision in this particular um, coding, scheme, uh, coding um, rating scale. So either one is acceptable as supervision, but certainly the clinical record might provide more details or supplementary information. Okay, so here we have an example of a nurse interviewing a certified nursing assistant. And as I said, there's some examples in the training manual. This is just one of the ones we pulled out for this particular um, uh, item or activity. So the nurse says, please describe how Mrs. L usually moves from sitting on the side of the bed or chair to a standing position. Once she is sitting, how does she get to a standing position? So the CNA says she needs help to get to uh, sitting up and then standing. And so the nurse has to kind of uh, ask a little bit more information in order to make sure she's focused on the actual activity that she's needing to score. So I'd like to know how much help she needs uh, for safety rising up from sitting in the chair or sitting in the bed to get to a standing position. So then the certified nursing assistant replies, she needs two people to assist her to stand up from sitting on the side of the bed or when she's sitting in the chair. So how would you code this? Uh, response four would be code, uh, press A, three, press B, press, uh, a two, press C, and for uh, one, press D. I'll give you a minute here. Okay, great, 100% on that. And the right answer is indeed what was collect, uh, reported by everybody. So she would be coded a D um, d dependent uh, because the uh, assistance of two helpers was uh, provided. One of the help desk questions that we got um, related to this particular item, sit to stand, is uh, what if the patient is um, not walking and that person is in a wheelchair? So you would actually code this one as 88 if the person does not get up to a standing position. Okay, next we're moving into transfers. So the first type of transfer is the car bed to chair transfer. And in this instance, the definition is the ability to safely transfer to and from a bed to a chair or a wheelchair. Um, many ways that this may be done in inpatient rehab. So it could be um, the person is uh, getting up from the bed and pivoting into the chair, or it could be a slide board is used that's certainly acceptable also. So. For the coding scenario that we'll be going through as a group, um, in the bed to uh, for the chair bed to chair transfer, uh, this example is about Mr. F and his medical conditions include morbid obesity, diabetes mellitus, and sepsis, and he recently underwent bilateral above the knee amputations. Mr. F uh, requires full assistance with transfers from the bed to the wheelchair using a lift device. Two certified nursing assistants are required to safely transfer him from the bed into the wheelchair. 
Mr. F is unable to assist with the transfer from his bed to the wheelchair. How would you code him? That's right, I hear a lot of ones, and I agree with that. So two helpers, plus he did not help at all, so he is dependent. So now we've got a polling question coming up. And um, again, this is chair, bed to chair transfer. So in this example, Ms. P has metastatic bone cancer severely affecting her ability to use upper extremities during her daily activities. Ms. P is motivated to assist with her transfers from the side of the bed to the wheelchair. Ms. P pushes herself up from the bed to begin to transfer while the therapist provides trunk support. Once standing, Ms. P shuffles her feet, turns, and slowly sits down into the wheelchair with the therapist providing trunk support. So if you were doing the transfer, you'd probably know how much help the person needed. Um, it's kind of hard to write this scenario and give you an idea, so we do provide some additional input that the therapist provides less than half of the effort in this instance. How would you code this patient? So I will give you a minute. The options are four, supervision or touching assistance would be coded A. Uh, three, partial moderate assistance would be coded B. Substantial maximal assistance would be coded two. And dependent one would be coded a D. So I'll just give you a minute. Okay, it looks like most people have submitted. So um, in this case, we have 88% of people coding B, which is indeed the correct response. So the rationale is that the therapist provided less than half of the effort uh, to complete the activity. Next, we're moving on to toilet transfer. Um, so again, um, the definition is on page eight of the IRFPI, and this refers to getting on and off a toilet or commode. So we have a, an example to just go through together. Mrs. Y is anxious about getting up to use the bathroom. She asks the certified nursing assistants to stay with her in the bathroom as she gets on and off the toilet. The certified nursing assistant stays with her as requested and provides verbal encouragement and instruction cues to Mrs. Y. How would you code this patient? I see some forefingers. Thank you. Okay, I agree. So, you know, I think I mentioned this as an example earlier. If, you know, the patient says, I want somebody with me, and the, the staff person decides that's appropriate, then you would reflect that. If it's um, for whatever reason, maybe it's somebody who's very anxious and the decision is that that person you know, is going home alone and that the staff feel that person is indeed safe and nobody is there, could be that person ended up being coded uh, independent. But in this instance, the uh, judgment was that somebody should stay with the person she was anxious, probably that's gonna be most of the situations and so I would agree the code of four would be reported for this um, Mrs. Y. Okay, so we've got another polling uh, question um, for toilet transfer. Mr. H has paraplegia, incomplete pneumonia, as well as uh, COPD. So he's got respiratory problems and maybe some endurance problems. He prefers to use bedside commode when uh, moving his bowels due to severe weakness, a history of falls, and dependent transfer status to certified nursing assistants assist during the toilet transfer. How would you code toilet transfer? So A would be uh, uh, pressed if you believe four, uh, B if you think three, two if you believe substantial maximal assistance, code one if you think one is the right code. All right, 98% coded one. I do agree that that is the right answer. And the rationale is that two helpers were required to complete the activity. Okay, so now we're getting into um, some of the activities that relate to, um, I 
I guess they're a lot more relevant at discharge. Again, some of these activities may not be performed at admission, and so you might be coding 88s to indicate the activity was not um, able to be assessed because of the patient's medical condition. So car transfers, uh, which, you know, whether somebody is going home to drive or if they are, as Kara mentioned, maybe they're going to be going to medical appointments in a cab or in a friend's car, they still need to learn how to get in and out of a car. So very relevant for, for many, many patients. So car transfer uh, is defined as the ability to transfer in and out of a car or van on the passenger side. It does not include the ability to open or close the door or fasten seat belt. So it's really just a transfer getting into and out of the car. So we have a polling question um, for car transfer. During her rehabilitation stay, Ms. N works with an occupational therapist on transfers into and out of a passenger side of a car. On the day before discharge, Ms. N requires verbal reminders for safety and light touching assistance as she transfers into and out of the car. The therapist instructs her on strategic hand placement as she transitions to sitting into the pass on the passenger seat. She needs light touching as she moves her feet into the car once seated. The same uh, amount and type of assistance is needed for her to transfer from the car seat to a standing position, so getting out of the car. The therapist opens and closes the door. So how would you code this? If you think the answer is six, press A. If you think the answer is five, set up or clean up assistance, press B. If you think it's supervision or touching assistance, press four. And if you think it's a three, partial moderate assistance, uh, press D. I, you know, in that example, it did talk about open closing door, but as I read in the definition, that's not included. So don't get tricked by that. Okay. All right. 100% say C is the right answer, and that is indeed the correct response C, uh, level four supervision touching assistance. So, rationale is that the patient. Um, the helper provides touching assistance uh, to the patient. And again, opening closing door is not included. Sounds like nobody got distracted by that. Okay, so now um, we're moving into that third column. So um, I indicated before that we have these gateway questions or screening questions, um, and it allows um, a situation that you're, you can skip over some items so that the computer can actually insert responses on your behalf. So the first um, item that's indented is the uh, does the patient walk question. So this is H1, and you can see clearly here how this is looks different than the rest of the items. So um, I'll just read the question, and then we have a coding scenario to go through. So if you actually look at the earth pie, you'll see that H1 asks, does the patient walk? The first response option is no, and walking goal is not clinically indicated. So this is um, an instance where somebody maybe has um, experienced uh, a spinal cord injury or somebody who's had a very severe stroke, and it's not expected that the person would be able to actually walk and uh, by discharge, and so the, um, in, if you mark this, then you would not be able in the IT system to be able to report a performance or a goal. If you respond one, that, so the answer is, to the question, does the patient walk? If the answer is one, then it's, the answer is no, and walking goal is clinically indicated. So if you mark this, you would not, you would skip over the admission assessment, but you'd be able to enter a goal. So if you want to be able to enter a walking goal and the person is not walking on admission, you'd have to code one. And then the third category of responses, does the patient walk? Yes. 
And if you say yes, then uh, responses are required on all the walking and stairs items that follow that we'll be talking about in just a minute. You may enter goals. Um, if you um, are not entering a goal um, because you've entered a goal elsewhere, um, you might put a dash if you're not wanting to put a goal related to walking. So I'll go through that because I see a couple of faces that maybe I wasn't clear. Um, so the question is for H1, does the patient walk? And you, there's two ways to say no. You can say no, the person doesn't walk and they're not expected to walk by discharge. You can, and that's code one. If the person isn't currently walking and they, zero, sorry, zero, sorry. Okay, let me start again. Thank you. All right, does a person walk? So zero, no, and the, uh, and the person is not expected to walk by discharge. If the answer, if you code one, that means that the person doesn't currently walk and a walking um, is a, an expectation perhaps by discharge and that allows you to enter a goal. So that's why you'd wanna code one. Thank you very much. And then if the person is walking now, then you code two for yes, and that means you can code all of those walking and stairs items and picking up the object and the um, goals can also be entered. So here we have an example. Uh, Mr. Z currently does not walk, but a walking goal is clinically indicated. So if you want to look at the Earth Pi to see the codes, uh, either 0, 1, or 2, how would you code this particular item? Okay, I agree. So you got it right. Um, patient does not currently walk, so the admission performance codes, uh, would you could not enter them because you've indicated they don't walk, so it wouldn't make sense that you would code that they were doing anything other than they couldn't. Um, so we're, there's quite a few items you're able to skip over. Um, walking goal is clinically indicated. You can enter a goal for any of the walking stairs or pick up object items. Okay, we have a polling uh, example next. So again, this is, does the patient walk? So in this instance, uh, we've got Ms. Y, who currently walks with great difficulty due to her progressive neurologic disease. It is not expected that Mrs. Y will continue to walk. Ms. Y also uses a wheelchair. So in this instance, you're just reporting whether she can walk or not. And so how would you code zero, one, or two? All right, so this is uh, zero would be no, and walking is not clinically indicated. Code one for no, and walking is clinically indicated, that's B, and then code two for yes, which would be a C. So does the person walk? Okay, give you, okay. So 94% indicated C, which is correct. So in this instance, it was a little bit of a distraction that she has a condition where she's gonna get worse, but all we're asking is, does the person currently walk? We only ask about goals if the person is not currently walking. So, um, say that again, okay. So if the um, patient currently walks, the expectation at discharge is not going to influence your response. If the person is currently walking, you code a two, even in this case where somebody may not be expected to walk by discharge. In most cases, people will be walking on admission and the goal will be improvement, but we put this example in to make sure that was very clear that it's just, does the person walk? So we've got, um, yeah, so here's the, the rationale. Again, the pa patient currently walks, so the answer is yes, the person does walk. Okay, so next, uh, if the person is walking, then uh, you would be filling out these next set of items. So there's a series of items related to walking and 
going up and down stairs and picking up an object. So the first uh, distance is 10 feet. So I, uh, we're getting to the bottom of page eight. I'll just read the definition. So walking 10 feet starts once the person is standing. So we've already covered getting from a seated to a standing position. So once the person's standing, it's their ability to walk, oh, I'm sorry, the ability to walk at least 10 feet in a room, corridor, or similar space. So it's any location. Given the short distance, it may be in the person's room if they've just gotten up out of bed. Could be in a therapy gym too, obviously. So here we have a practice coding scenario. And in um, so we'll, this will be polling. Uh, so get out your gadgets in a minute. Um, so in this instance, Mrs. C has Parkinson's disease and walks with a walker. The physical therapist must advance the walker for Ms. C with every step. The physical therapist assists Ms. C by physically initiating the stepping movement forward, advancing Mrs. C's foot during the activity of walking 10 feet. The assistance provided to Ms. C is more than half of the effort to walk the 10 foot distance. How would you code this item for this uh, patient? So A would be code four, supervision or touching assistance. B, if you believe code three, partial or moderate assistance. C, to code two, substantial maximal assistance. And D, code one for dependent. Okay. Quieting down. All right, 96% um, of the participants say C, and I do agree with that response, code two. The rationale is that the patient provides more than half of the effort for the patient to complete the activity. So next we have um, a walk with 50, uh, 50 feet with two turns. And so, um, you know, again, when we were uh, working on developing the item set, one of our therapists talked about the importance of uh, walking while turning. And so uh, that is a, an item that is included in this data set. And you will see it also under wheelchair later on. So walking 50 feet with two turns is defined as it starts once the person is standing, so similar to the other walking item, the ability to walk at least 50 feet and make two turns. So in this instance, Miss L is unable to bear her full weight on her left leg. As she walks 60 feet down the hall with her crutches, so maybe this person had hip, uh, some kind of fractured leg, and um, so she's making two turns, her husband supports her trunk. So maybe she's turning around the corner in the hallway or um, into her room. So um, he, the husband in this case is the helper and he provides less than half of the effort. How would you code this patient? So A would be a code of four, supervision or touching assistance. B would be three, partial or moderate assistance. C would be a code two, substantial maximal assistance, and D, you'd code one, dependent. So I will give you a minute. Okay, all right, so 95% uh, coded B, which is uh, code three, partial moderate assistance, and I do agree with that. So in this instance, it was a family member that was helping. So obviously, you know, similar to what I mentioned before, you would use clinical judgment to determine whether that was something that um, was indeed an assessment. And in this case, if it was, uh, you would code a three. Okay, so um, in this case, um, the, there was uh, trunk support. Okay, uh, next item uh, is walking 150 feet. And so this is actually the last item at the bottom of page eight. So in this instance, uh, once this is, starts again, once standing and refers to the ability to walk at least 150 feet in a corridor or similar place. 
So it's, you know, it's probably not the room anymore just because of the distance. So in this, um, this is going to be a polling questions. So polling question. So Mr. R has endurance limitations due to heart failure and has only walked about 30 feet during the three day assessment period. He has not walked 150 feet or more during the assessment period, including with the physical therapist who has been working with Mr. R. The therapist speculates that Mr. R could walk this distance in the future with additional assistance. So how would you code this particular item? A, code one for dependent. B, code seven, patient refused. Code C, nine, not applicable. Code D, 88, not attempted due to medical condition or safety concern. So I know this is gonna generate some questions. I'll give you a minute to think about it, so you're, you're doing some thinking through it, and then we'll, we'll talk through it. You ready? Okay. All right, all right. Well, D, excellent, 89%. Um, so I would agree with that. Um, I know that we've had questions on the help desk about, well, why isn't this dependent? And because we have the different uh, distances for walking and somebody wouldn't carry somebody or you know, walk for them the 150 feet, you would code 88 for this particular activity. So great, I expected a little bit more of a distribution on that based on some questions that have come into the help desk. So same, same thing would apply, by the way, for stairs. So we have 12 stairs as an activity later on, you'll see. So if the person can't do it, um, maybe somebody can do one step or four steps, but not 12 steps. So you would code activity not attempted if, there, the, uh, if there's not an attempt to go the 12 steps or in this case, the 150 feet. Okay, so the activity was not attempted. Okay, now we're moving to another walking item, but in this case, it's walking 10 feet on uneven surfaces. So I will read this definition. So we're actually now turning onto page nine at the top uh, where the definition of walking 10 feet on uneven surfaces refers to the ability to walk 10 feet on uneven or sloping surfaces such as grass or gravel. And this does start uh, once uh, the person is in a standing position, so as with all the other walking items. So um, this item actually was um, added when we were, again, doing the um, development of the item set, um, which started about 10 years ago. Um, we looked to the International Classification of Functioning, and they included walking on uneven surfaces. In talking with clinicians, some inpatient rehab facilities create a bit of an obstacle course. Um, I know in Chicago, you wouldn't want to discharge a patient to walk up and down Michigan Avenue uh, without being able to do something like this. Um, it is certainly acceptable that you may take a patient outdoors to assess uneven surfaces. Some locations have gardens where you can take somebody out to walk on grass. Those are all very acceptable um, ways to assess this activity. Again, I'm expecting that this won't be done very often on admission. That was definitely what we saw during the um, testing of these particular items. So we have a polling question that we'll be doing together. So in this instance, we've got a patient called Mrs. N who has severe degenerative disease and is recovering from sepsis. Upon discharge, Mrs. N will need to be able to walk on uneven surfaces and sloping surfaces because maybe she's gonna get her mail and her driveway is sloped. And so that's going to be something that's important for her to be able to do before she's discharged safely. Near the end of her Earth stay, so let's say it's the day before discharge, and this is the discharge assessment, the physical therapist takes Miss 
Mrs. N outside to walk on uneven surfaces. So again, it could be uh, grass, it could be um, uh, sloping dry, uh, sloping area, but something that's uneven and challenges her a little bit. Mrs. N requires the therapist weight-bearing assistance several times during walking in order to prevent Mrs. N from falling as she navigates walking 10 feet over uneven surfaces. So how would you code Ms. N? So if you believe the res correct response is four, uh, press A for supervision touching assistance. Three, partial moderate assistance would be B. Two, substantial maximal assistance would be coded C. And code of one dependent would be uh, D on your gadget. So please vote. Okay, are you ready? It sounds like there's a lot of discussion. I'll give you a minute. Okay, so it's between a B, three, and a two. Okay, those are reasonable. The correct response actually is a three. Um, in this instance, we felt that the um, patient was doing more than half of the effort. However, for those of you who coded two, if your interpretation was that the patient um, was doing less than half of the effort, then, I mean, you understand the coding. Um, I think, you know, sometimes it's hard to write these scenarios and not, you know, be uh, giving away the answer. So um, maybe this wasn't the clearest of examples, but basically, I mean, I, I think based on your previous responses, if the, the helper is doing most of the efforts, it's a two. If um, the patient is doing most of the effort, uh, it's a three. Okay, so now we're going to move on to mobility uh, one step, which is basically a curb. So um, obviously anybody who is out in the community and the goal of rehabilitation is to get people back into the community. So walking up and down one step or a curb is important. Okay, if you have questions, please write them down. I'll be happy to, I, I've got lunch to go over them with my team and uh, be happy to address your questions. So um, again, goal of rehabilitation is uh, to get people back into the community, so going up and down one step is often a daily activity for people. Uh, it can be a step in the therapy gym or it can be a curb if you take people outside. And the definition on the ERF pie, so this is on page nine, uh, the ability to step over a curb or up and down one step. So we do have a polling uh, example practice coding scenario uh, for this one step or curb. Mrs. Z had a stroke and needs to learn how to step up and down uh, one step to enter and exit her home. The physical therapist provides standby assistance as she uses her quad cane to aid her balance in stepping up one step. The physical therapist provides touching assistance as Mrs. Z uses her cane for balance and steps down one step. So standby assistance um, while the patient was um, stepping up and then touching assistance when she was going down. So a little bit more assistance on the way down. So again, this is polling. Uh, Press A if you think the correct response is three, supervision touching assistance. If you think three is the right answer, partial moderate assistance. Um, code B, uh, code two would be C, and code one would be D. Okay, I'll give you a minute. Okay. 
All right, 96% say A, and I do agree with that response. That's what our team came up with for four supervision touching assistants. The helper provides touching assistance as Mrs. Z completes the activity of uh, stepping down one step. Okay, so next uh, we will go into four steps. So in this particular instance, um, Four steps is defined as the ability to go up and down four steps with or without a rail. And we have a practice coding scenario here for four steps. Mr. J has lower body weakness and the physical therapist provides touching assistance when he ascends four steps. While descending four steps, the physical therapist provides trunk support, so that's more than touching assistance, as Mr. J holds on to the railing. So, um, what do you, how would you code Mr. J? So, press A if you believe a code of five, setup or cleaning assistance, would be the correct code. Press B if you think supervision or touching assistance would be the correct code. Press C if uh, three is, you believe, the correct code for partial moderate assistance and D, press two if you think substantial or maximal assistance would be the correct code. And I will give you a bit of time. Okay, think quite down. Hundred percent go with C, which is three, and that is the correct response. Excellent. Okay, and uh, again, the rationale, obviously, touching assistance, since you all got that right. I think we'll just uh, wrap up with this the, the last stairs item, and then we will break for lunch. We'll pick back up after lunch with the rest of the items and um, have time for some questions. So again, please do fill out the question forms and provide your name and email address uh, to help us if you'd like a direct response um, in addition to us being able to address them here. Okay, so 12 steps. So the definition of 12 steps on the Earth Pie is the ability to go up and down 12 steps with or without a rail. So it's the same as the other steps items, just the higher number of steps in this instance. So uh, this is a polling question. Miss Y is recovering from a stroke result or resulting in motor issues and poor endurance. Miss Y's home has 12 steps with a railing and she needs to use these stairs to enter and exit her home. The physical therapist uses a gate belt around her trunk and supports less than half of the effort as Miss Y ascends and then descends the 12 steps. So, what do you think? Um, how would you code walking up and down 12 steps for this patient? Press A if you think the correct response is five, set up for cleanup assistance. Code B, or press B if you think a code of four, supervision or touching assistance. C if three, partial moderate assistance. D would be a code of two, for substantial or maximal assistance. I will give you a short time. Okay, all right, looks like 96% coded C, and that is the um, score that the team came up with for partial or moderate assistance. The rationale being that the helper provided less than half of the effort in providing the necessary support for Miss Y to ascend and descend 12 steps. So we are picking back up with slide uh, 203. We'll be talking about the item mobility pickup object and that is item P and section GG0170. So I do want to be sure to give you the definition. And um, the definition is the ability to bend, stoop from a standing position to pick up a small object, such as a spoon, 
uh, from the floor. So if somebody is not able to stand up, um, this item can't be completed. You would code 88. It does need to be from a standing position. That's a question that we have had come in through the help desk. So I just have one coding scenario for us to do together here. Um, Mr. P has a neurologic condition that has resulted in coordination problems. He wants to be as independent as possible, so that's his goal. Mr. P lives with his wife and will soon be discharged. He tends to drop objects and has been practicing bending or stooping from a standing position to pick up small objects such as a spoon from the floor. The occupational therapist needs to remind Mr. P of safety strategies when he bends to pick up objects from the floor and she uh, needs to steady him with touching assistance to prevent him from falling. So how would you code this item on the rating scale and what is your rationale? Okay, heard a lot of fours out there, that's right. So uh, the helper, in this case a the therapist, provided supervision or touching assistance. Specifically it was studying touching assistance. Okay, we have um, another uh, example to go over. Miss C has recently undergone a hip replacement. When she drops items, she uses a long-handled reacher that she has been using at home prior to admission. She is ready for discharge and can now ambulate with a walker without assistance. When she drops objects from her walker basket, she requires the certified nursing assistant to locate her long-handled reacher and bring it to her in order for her to use it. She does not need assistance to pick up the object after the helper brings the reacher. So as I mentioned before, it doesn't matter if people use a device or not to perform an activity, certainly very acceptable. Um, in this instance, somebody needs to bring the reacher, the device, to her in order for her to be able to actually complete the activity of picking up an object from the floor. How would you code this and what is your rationale? Okay, I heard a lot of fives and I would agree with that. So the helper provides setup assistance because the person cannot perform the activity without somebody bringing the reacher to her. Okay, so um, now we are actually moving into um, another screening question. So if you look at your actual ERPPI, you will see that this is on admission, it's that third column in. On the discharge assessment, it's indented in from the um, assessment of the discharge assessment. So this particular question is a gateway question or a screening question and asks about whether the patient uses a wheelchair uh, slash scooter, so either one. If, um, and I, you know, again, as I mentioned before, we are really uh, interested in assessments, not whether somebody was just put into a wheelchair to be taken to therapy. So if somebody has experienced a, a severe enough condition that they are in a wheelchair and they will be building mobility skills related to wheelchair, you would absolutely be assessing this item. It is certainly appropriate that um, a patient may be going home and be both walking and using a wheelchair, and so walking and wheelchair will be filled out on the ERPI. There is no restriction about only walking or only wheelchair. If the person is walking, you say, yes, that person's walking, you score the appropriate items. If the person is also using a wheelchair, you code the wheelchair items. If a, a person um, is not able to walk at this point in time and they only use a wheelchair, then you would be uh, coding wheelchair. The, um, the item then, again, just asks, does the patient use a wheelchair or scooter? And if the answer is no, um, then you actually skip out of the next two items because they're both wheelchair items, so they're not applicable, and the computer will fill it out. It's basically just a way for you to um, skip over the, those two items. If you say yes, then that opens up those two items. So we will talk through those items next. So the first item is wheel 50 feet with two turns. And uh, the definition is um, it starts when the person is seated. So that'll be true for both wheelchair items. So it starts when the person is seated in the wheelchair or scooter. And it's the ability to wheel at least 50 feet and make two turns. 
So we have a practice coding scenario. So if you can find your um, gadgets to press your codes. Um, we have an example. Once seated in a manual wheelchair, Ms. R wheels about 10 feet, then asks the therapist to push the wheelchair an additional 40 feet to her room in her bathroom. So there is some turning happening as part of this, and the 50 feet uh, is what happens, but the patient does a little bit, and the therapist or, uh, yeah, therapist is needed, the helper, to do some of the effort. So how would you code this item, GGO170R? So one option for A would be code 4, B would be code 3, C would be 2, and D if you think the right answer is 1. Okay. All right, so 93% coded C, and I do agree that uh, two substantial maximal assistance would make sense for that um, example. So the helper provides more than half of the effort in this instance. So as I mentioned before, in this case, in addition to the screening or gateway question, we also have follow-up questions. So in order for us to really understand what's going on with the patient, we'd like to know what type of uh, wheelchair the person uses. So basically, we have this RR1 um, on the admission that um, we ask you to indicate whether the wheelchair or scooter was one, manual, or two, um, a motorized wheelchair. The next item is, again, another wheelchair item, but this time the distance is 150 feet. So if you're looking at the IRFPI, the definition, once seated in a wheelchair or scooter, the ability to wheel at least 150 feet in a corridor or similar space. So we have just one example to go over together. Um, Mr. G always uses a motorized scooter to mobilize himself down the hallway. The therapist provides cues due to safety issues, specifically to avoid running into walls. How would you code this item, wheel 150 feet, and what is your rationale? Okay, um, that would be coded a four, supervision or touching assistance. So in this case, there's verbal cues that are being uh, provided to the patient in order for the activity to be uh, done safely. Again, there is a follow-up question here. What type of wheelchair um, would, is used when uh, wheeling 150 feet is the item? So the same codes apply, one for manual and two for motorized. So those are all the mobility items. As um, we spoke earlier about goals, so in addition to the self-care um, items being able to code goals, there's also space on the admission form to code discharge goals for patients in the area of mobility. So um, that is in the second column of the admission assessment, and it covers two pages, uh, just like the items do. And Basically, the guidance that we provided earlier related to self-care is all the same here. And so I'm, I'm not going to go through that in detail, but I did want to just reinforce that only codes one through six can be coded as goals because it um, wouldn't necessarily make sense for a refusal to be a goal. And if a patient can't perform an activity, uh, you can code that as a one for a goal. Or the expectation is the person cannot perform, would not be able to perform that um, activity by discharge. You can put one as a goal. And again, licensed clinicians can establish patient goals for discharge at the time of admission. We did have a question uh, that came in uh, during the break about whether you can change goals. So I will address that now because that's actually a really good question. So um, you. We, we do have this three-day assessment period for the assessment if you need that amount of time or uh, to, to set goals. Um, so after a goal is established and uh, documented either as part of the care plan in the chart or perhaps it's on the IRFPI at that point in time, 
Um, if circumstances change, um, you cannot go back and change it. However, we certainly recognize, CMS certainly recognizes that in some instances, patient goals may change, or perhaps there wasn't enough information available within those three days. Perhaps there was new information that uh, became available after that. So within the chart, you may certainly update the care plan, but on the ERF pie, you would not change after the three-day um, assessment period. And again, the, I just want to again reinforce that the quality measure that is focused on reporting goal data, um, CMS, uh, at this point, the, the quality measure is that you complete an admission and discharge functional assessment for the selected items and that there's a, a minimum of one goal reported. So CMS is not calculating the percent of people who met goals. That's certainly something that you can do internally for quality improvement. Um, you know, get credit for the work that you do and, you know, document it in some way, but it's not a part of the quality measure. Um, I did want to, so I think I mentioned this before, but I will reinforce this. Um, so, um, in the case that somebody has an unplanned discharge, um, and I actually, we have a scenario here where Mr. C was admitted to the ERF with healing complex post-surgical, uh, post-surgery open reduction internal fixation fractures as well as sepsis. Uh, he has complications during the ERF stay and he is unexpectedly needing to return to the acute care uh, hospital resulting in his discharge from Earth. So let's say it's not a program interruption, he's gone for more than three overnights. And so um, in this case, um, as I mentioned before, you would be able to code 88 for the activities uh, in self-care and mobility to indicate that he was too sick to have these activities performed. If you'd like to report goals, because maybe you, know, you did assess them, at, for whatever reason at that point in time, um, it won't be rejected, but again, to reinforce for the uh, quality measures where we're looking at functional improvement, patients who have unexpected discharges, including a discharge to acute care, would be excluded from calculating the quality measure improvement in self-care and improvement in mobility. So regardless of what you put here, that won't be counted for or, or against you, I guess, for that particular. And, and the rationale behind that is that uh, the person did not have a full course of rehabilitation. And so, you know, there was this um, unfortunate complication that occurred uh, for this patient. So in summary for this section, so thank you for bearing with me through most of the morning and afternoon. Um, this uh, section focuses obviously on self-care and mobility activities. Uh, knowledge about the patient's status prior to the current event is very relevant for treatment goals. And so that's why this was important to include on the data set at this point in time. Um, Kara mentioned uh, earlier today about the importance of that action plan in your packet. So um, in terms of action plan related to this section, uh, we would uh, recommend that you review the importance and rationale of obtaining and documenting punct functional status as part of the training, uh, including things like walking on uneven surfaces and car transfers. Um, we recommend you review the six level rating scale and the activity not attempted codes with the staff as you uh, provide your training and that you provide um, or, and that you evaluate your current documentation to ensure that information that is in the medical record will allow you to complete this information. I know when I have looked at um, some medical records, sometimes it's very hard um, to actually get information such as type of wheelchair. It's not necessarily always in a standard location in some of the records that I've looked at, part of one of the projects I'm working on. Um, also, uh, things like oral hygiene aren't specifically called out, and so those kinds of things are definitely information that you'll want to look to see how easy is it for this information to be pulled out if somebody, if you're the EarthPi coordinator and you're relying on other people to do the assessments, can you get the information? Or is it going to be a certain discipline that's um, 
maybe assigned to some of these items and they'll be looking as part of their formal assessment to document it in a certain location. And finally, uh, we recommend practicing with a variety of coding examples. So there's some in the training manual. There's some additional ones that we provided here today. Um, we will also be putting out some additional information in the future. So um, that's certainly something that um, I know uh, we would like to provide you in the near future so that you can have some more practice. So at this point, I wanted to address some of the questions that have come in, and I'm actually going to ask one of my colleagues, Roberta Constantine, to come up and help with me. So I, I guess while Roberta's on her way up here, um, I will do a quick introduction. So um, Roberta is a senior research public health analyst at RTI International. Roberta um, and I have known each other for a long time on various projects related to quality measurement in inpatient rehab facilities. She's a nurse uh, by training, um, worked in several different locations in the area of uh, cardiac care, and uh, Roberta was also part of the original team developing the care item set, and uh, so she and I have done a lot of travels together over the last decade or so. This is true. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, thank you very much. And we also thought we'd give Anne's voice a little bit of a break. Um, and not only that, we thought we'd uh, enter uh, having somebody with a strong Boston accent, so hopefully everybody would, will be able to understand me. We thought we'd throw that into the mix. Um, so we're not going to have time for all the questions. The questions are great, and, and, and a lot of the circumstances as we were reading through the questions, it seemed like more than anything else it was points of clarification. But please know that you know we'll be getting through you know, more of the questions over the, the course of the training, and anything that we don't get to, it will definitely, uh, we'll be um, answering those questions and putting it up on the CMS website. So what we thought we'd do as a first pass is just try to look at some of the questions that seem to be sort of frequent, frequent themes. And one of them has to do with walkers. So I'm going to try to be very agile and bring this up bring the question up. Yep. And this question is, so it's GG110, and the question is, is a hemi walker um, considered A, D, a walker, or two, none of the above? And the answer is a hemi walker is considered a walker. In fact, um, there's another question. It's not, uh, we also got a question about a rolling walker. So anything that has walker at the end of it is a sure bet that it's going to be a walker. So um, we were, a couple of um, questions came up. So just to let you know, it's actually so a standard walker, a hemi walker, a rolling walker, platform walker. So when in doubt, walker. That's your, that's your, your clue. Um, but no, that's, that's a great clarification. Another excellent question that came in, and we saw it again, had to do with what, especially I'm sure in rehab, everybody wants to get out of, and that is the hospital gown. So the question had to do with dressing, and let me see if I can just scroll up the first one. Um, let's see, I think the first one comes up. <coughs> And thanks, advance, for your patience. Oh, here we are. OK. Upper body dressing. And the question is, since pajamas count, do hospital gowns also count? Um, so the answer is, hospital gowns do not count. Anything, anything but. So pajama, um, we, there's also sometimes you get questions about whether a sweatshirt, if something something needs buttons or whatever, and it's what's typical for clothing for, for the patient. So anything but the hospital gown does count as, as um, clothing. And similar to that, in that same genre, um, genre was footwear. So uh, we talked about anti-embolic stockings, which we also call sometimes heads, but there were a few questions regarding um, specifically what was included in footwear. So if I scroll down this, sorry, we're trying to do this on the fly. Um, 
one question had to do with, I'm just trying to think, the footwear six. Okay, thanks for your patience as I scroll. Um, okay, um, in the Earth Pie Manual, section GG, uh, there are no coding examples for lower body dressings. Um, but does item 130H include anti-embolic stockings? And the answer is yes, it does. And when it does, oh, yeah, go ahead. So it's, yeah. so it's uh, footwear. I'm sorry. Footwear. Yeah, yeah. So um, as Roberta said, we will provide some additional examples. And um, so I, I think I mentioned this as when I was talking about dressing in general, and I don't remember upper body dressing or lower body dressing or, or footwear. So um, anti-embolic stockings would be considered a piece of clothing, and it fit footwear better than lower body dressing. Um, a prosthesis or orthosis would be lower body dressing. I think yep. we had questions about that, too. Yep, and there was another question in regards to a, um, a knee brace as, as well, and would that be considered clothing? And, and again, anything along those lines would be considered as clothing. So I think we had walker, uh, patient gown, footwear, liquids was also something that came up uh, a number of times, and tube feeding. So let me see if I can find that. So the question is, um, how do you score, oh, if a patient has PO food as well as tube feeding, um, how would, would you score that? And the answer is yes, you would score that for the eating item. Another question that came up uh, regarding liquids, and we'll clarify this also. Um, this is good for helping us think about um, additions to the manual as well. On 17, we have, um, oh, that's the wheelchair, usual. There was another question. Um, yeah, I think there was a the question, if somebody only had liquids, would you still code them for eating? And the answer is yes. So code whatever assistance was just related to liquid. So basically, if somebody eats by mouth or drinks by mouth or both eats and drinks by mouth, code that. If the person is only on tube feeding um, or you know some kind of alternative means, uh, then that's when you would code activity did not occur for eating. Mm -hmm. And probably last in the group of questions, um, there was some clarification asked for and some examples in regards to usual performance. Um, and regarding us usual performance, does CMS have an expectation for how many times an item will be accessed or observed? There are many items that will be seen once during the three-day assessment period. So obviously, um, what, let me, what you really want to do for, uh, or think about when assessing usual performance, like Obviously, something like eating or whatever, you would expect to see maybe multiple times. But maybe a patient, whether it's being walking down the hallway or whatever, you wouldn't see necessarily more than once, if at all, during the three-day assessment period. And that's where you, when you really want to use your best clinical judgment. I mean, um, our goal is you want to get a baseline of the patient. Again. Before therapy is started, when your your expectations are for improvement, but you might not see um, an activity occur during the first day, and especially depending on when the patient was admitted. You know, if they're admitted late at night or something like that, or um, uh, you know, early, you know, very early in the morning or whatever, and there's a lot going on with the patient getting admitted to the to the ER. Um, do you want to go down? More sure. Yeah. Um, yep. Um, so there was a question about when the three day ends. Is that based oh. on hours or days? So um, the three days end at 11:59 on the third day. So it is calendar day. So if somebody's admitted on Friday at you know nine o'clock at night, Friday is day one, Saturday is day two, Sunday is day three. 11:59 for uh, Sunday. That's when the assessment time 
stopped. Um, another question in that was asked was about showering and bathing self. And for definition, uh, it states the ability to bathe self in, self in a tub or shower. So if it's only a bed bath, how would you code this item? And again, that's, that's allowable. Um, if a patient is washing up um, either at their bedside or they're in the bathroom at a sink, you can, um, you can code that item. Uh, let's see. We had another question about verbal cueing, and the question was whether intermittent verbal cueing just a little bit or constant verbal cueing made a difference in the score, and the answer is no. There could be a tiny bit of verbal cueing or constant cueing, and that would still be at the same level uh, related to the supervision score. Okay, and what about... Um, yeah, we had another one about what if the goal is the person would be in the community using a wheelchair and walking when they're in their home? How would you score walking and wheelchair? If both activities are being worked on during the inpatient rehab stay, um, absolutely code both of them. There's no, you know, only do walking or only do wheelchair. Code whatever is relevant for that person. You may certainly report walking and wheelchair for the same patient. Another question was, can you pick information from one discipline to submit the codes? For example, whether it's the, the bed or a wheelchair chance for OT, PT, or nursing, we all do it, which um, obviously uh, in inpatient rehab facilities, it's a team approach. But this is where you do, um, you know, um, everybody should have input in regards to the code. You would get information, whether it be from um, a certified uh, nurse's aide or nursing, but I think for on a, on a facility level, you want to decide who ultimately is going to be the one who decides who decides the code. And everybody has different processes. I mean, in any demonstration I've been in, you know, each facility really has their own way that they handle their their policy and procedures and how they, um, how they deliver care. So it's important for the facility um, would be the one who decides that for themselves. But we would expect multidisciplinary team that you would get a lot of input from across the disciplines. Great. Okay. Um, we had another question about um, a patient who maybe has tetraplegia complete. And so maybe eating is not something that's going to be something they would be able to do at discharge. And so is it acceptable to have a goal of level one dependent? And the answer is absolutely yes. Um, in that circumstance, you know, there may be goals related to maybe some wheelchair mobility or other types of activities, but maybe eating is not something that the person will be able to um, show improvement. And so it's absolutely acceptable to say that the person is dependent on admission and dependent uh, is the goal. Okay. Another question is upper body dressing. Um, it doesn't specify specifically sort of gathering of the clothing items uh, and whether to take that into account when coding. Needs to be more specific, are we just to assume? And that's a good question and comment. So um, this to us would be definitely part of um, the setup, um, the setup or cleanup assistance. So even though it's, it's you know, I guess, you can uh, you often think about sort of setting somebody up to bathe or whatever, but if you're gathering clothing and bringing it to the bedside, that's part of that assistance. Okay. Yeah, we had some general questions um, asking why certain activities like tub shower transfer are not on uh, this particular um, in this particular section. So, in part, um, you know, there are a lot of activities that are done in an inpatient rehab facility. And we're not asking for everything to be on this data set because it would be very long if we had everything that could be possibly done. Um, so we would absolutely encourage you to do things that are relevant for your patients, but in that circumstance, you don't need to report it to CMS. So tub shower transfer, definitely something that would be done, assessed, um, it's just not something that you need to report to CMS. Um, yeah, I think, yeah, I think there was um, some, uh, I think a question um, maybe that came in um, through the help desk that I don't think I addressed well 
um, during my presentation, so I just wanted to, to highlight that. So the um, question was about what prior functioning time frame was. So we talk about in those first couple of questions prior to the current uh, illness, injury, or exacerbation. And so uh, the questions come in, what does that really mean? So um, uh, I think we had an example where a patient had a spinal cord injury like 30 years ago, and then the person had a pressure ulcer and maybe some other complications, and they were admitted to either the ERF directly or uh, to acute care and then the ERF. So in this instance, it's really the pressure ulcer situation complication that triggered the admission. And so in this instance, the prior functioning is right before uh, that kind of pressure ulcer events happened. And again, uh, the purpose of us collecting that data is so that you can set goals based on their prior functioning. So I hope that kind of makes sense that you would say, okay, this person had a spinal cord injury 30 years ago, so whatever um, functional limitations would be associated with that, you'd want to report that so that we can risk adjust for that. And that person might be in a wheelchair, so obviously you'd want all that documented so we can adequately adjust for uh, functional improvement. Another example, somebody experienced a stroke, so that's you know a common yeah. diagnosis in rehab. So um, it would be immediately prior to the stroke. If somebody's had, you know, they're admitted for a stroke and this is maybe the third time that person had had a stroke, it would be right before the most recent stroke. If somebody's having surgery, it would be right before they're admitted to acute care for the surgery. So I hope that all makes sense. Um, and there was another question for code 03. Is it when the helper performs less than 50% for code 02, it is when the helper performs more than 50%. What do you code when the helper performs exactly 50%? That's a, that's a good one. Okay. Um, so this would be, I mean, everyone has, you know, everyone has such wonderful backgrounds. This is where it really comes up to your clinical judgment. I mean... You don't have eyes, you know, looking at you, making sure, you know, it's, oh, it's, it's actually at 50%. But really think, you know, step back and, and just think about sort of the big picture. And in that case, what, what does make it, what does make more sense? Do you think it's more of a partial moderate assist or more of a substantial maximal assist? So that, that's up to you. Um, okay, we, we had another question which was uh, whether the information that's gathered during the pre-assessment can be used to complete uh, some of the items. So um, the uh, self-care mobility activities that are uh, GG0130 and 170, uh, you know, people's status could absolutely change. Obviously, you'd be doing your own assessment. But if in the pre-assessment there's information about prior functioning, absolutely, you could use some of that. And I know when Gina and Karen present later, they'll talk about things like influenza, and certainly something like influenza uh, status might be in some of that pre-admission assessment. So that would absolutely be fine. Um, so I hope that was the, the uh, question that person had. They just kind of generally had this question about pre-assessment. So I think prior functioning would be fine. Um, I, I don't see the other information. Um, I, I don't think that that would be something you would substitute for an assessment. Okay. Another question uh, was uh, asked that says, are you saying there will be no risk of penalty for any dashes used for goals as long as one goal is entered? So that is correct. However, we encourage you to, if you're setting more goals for the patient, if that's realistic, then, then we would hope, just as, as part of a good assessment in clinical practice, that you would enter all the goals that, that, you, that you assess and you set for the patient. Okay. 
Yeah, I think yep. I think those were the ones um, that we captured. So you know, we will be going through these in more detail. We just had a short time to look through these, so um, we will um, definitely be putting out more information. Okay. Your questions are really appreciated to make sure that we're meeting your educational needs. So. Um, just want to reinforce that CMS does have a uh, help desk for the inpatient rehab facility quality reporting program, and that um, I think that will probably be presented maybe later today or tomorrow, and we encourage you to write questions. We will put frequently asked questions on the website, maybe an update to the manual with a lot of this information. Okay. So with that... Yep, so hopefully though we uh, we sort of hit the top five or ten um, where we got a lot of questions. And again, um, that GG is a, is a large section to get through, so congratulations, you're, you're finished with that. Everyone's had lunch, so you're ready for the next section. So, so thank you all, thank you for your questions. All right, thank you. Thank you.